Great to test the. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Uh, nice to see you all. Um, let's just give you our lovely little uh, intro that we all love and uh, enjoy, which is this. Ready? Play. And I will leave you in the capable hands of uh, Vanch and Shrihari, who will preview tonight's match. Have a good night, guys. Yeah, we'll try to enjoy this one. It should be a cracker. Um, yeah, so, really looking forward to it. Yeah, Nadal versus Fritz. Vanch, uh, I should say, especially on Twitter, somebody who has been quite positive about Taylor Fritz and people don't like that too for all the reasons I don't want to get into. Uh, mm. It's kind of stupid, uh, but you know, I don't think there's any denying, no matter how you feel about him, that he does deserve to be here, right? Not the way he would have liked to gotten here, liked to have gotten here, but still, nonetheless, right? He definitely was one of the best players throughout this season. Uh, so, quick thoughts, Vanj, uh, about how you think this match is going to go, uh, assuming both of them are a hundred percent this time. Yeah, uh, that last bit is hopefully that's that, that's probably the main thing I'm hoping for, to be honest, because um, yeah. you know they, these two have met twice this year. Obviously, Taylor Fritz improved so much since last year uh, fall since the breakout Indian Wells that he had in October. That's when I started to see him really get to that next level. You know, he was sort of in between a 15 and 30 ranked player, but then he really sort of made the next step in his game. And to me, what's improved so much is his aggression on the court, his ability to go after his forehand. We know he's always had a world-class two-handed backhand, which, by the way, will help him a lot in this matchup. He's always had a wonderful serve. Um, and the two things that have improved for me is the athletic ability, the explosive movement in the corners, and just going after every single forehand that he can possibly go and just playing with intent every single time. And um, against against Nadal, he's going to be he's going to have to play for strike tennis on the front foot. He's going to have to mix up his serve. Um, he has a really nice serve where he can hit all all the spots with the same ball toss. Not many players on the tour can do that, and um, he's going to have to use that wide serve, especially on the deuce side, to get Nadal stretched out uh, so he can dictate play with his plus one. And I also think he has a world-class two-handed backhand. It's very precise, very flat. It'll skip through these courts, which are still playing pretty quickly. I think they're slower than last year. You're seeing a lot more rallies, and you're seeing the weight of shot also play into effect, um, which is key, I think, uh, for this matchup to really be fun to watch because Nadal obviously has that heavy, loopy topspin forehand, which does a lot of damage, and he can create angles with it. And if Fritz is um, if Fritz's two-handed backhand is as precise as it's been all year, Nadal is going to have some trouble in that cross-court forehand to backhand uh, pattern. So it'll be key for Nadal to change and go down the line with his forehand, open up the court in other ways. Uh, I think bringing Fritz forward is probably a good idea for Rafa, especially because um, you know Taylor is not the most sound in the forecourt. I think actually that's one thing that Tiafo and Paul are probably better than Fritz at. Um, is they have better feel and touch and hands at the net. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, we've seen a lot of these matchups this year with Nadal against Americans, right? We've seen players take it to Nadal with their um, taking the ball extremely early uh, off the backhand and sort of rushing Nadal on quicker courts. So I'm interested to see what Nadal does um, in order to negate Fritz's plus one and also um, get into the patterns that he likes to get into. So it's going to be really fascinating. And I'm also interested to see how, how Nadal's serve looks after um, the last six months. Obviously, he struggled with his abdominal um, at Wimbledon. That was clear. Um, and uh, other times, we haven't really seen the best version of Rafa since Roland Garros, I would say. So it's been a long time. So I'm, I'm curious to see uh, just how he's moving and how he's serving. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's about the best uh, sort of preview you could possibly get for this match. And uh, one particular aspect that interests me and something we saw quite a bit in their Indian Wells final was the backhand to forehand exchanges cross court, right? I mean, we've, you and I yeah. especially, we've talked so much about uh, how uh, the likes of Djokovic, uh, the reason why his matchup against Nadal is so good is that he pretty much has the upper hand of both of the uh, sections of the uh, you know cross court rally, right? especially Taylor Fritz's uh, cross court backhand. It can definitely put Nadal's forehand on a quite a bit of duress, especially since these are not conditions uh, that he would really favor as far as uh, you know trying to defend from the back court goes. Uh, yeah. Indian Wells obviously much lower court. Um, granted, Nadal was not 100% there, 
we still saw uh you know fritz using that backhand to really good effect especially the cross court backhand he takes it really uh early and it's really smooth as well you know not too many errors from if if you are to draw errors out from taylor fritz it would be from the forehand his backhand is really solid uh, he can serve really well, get a lot of free points too if he has to. You know, he's put up some serving masterclasses in the past. And if he does have a good serving day, it, you know, it, things could really go his way. Uh, not to say that he's the favorite by any means for this match. I still lean uh, slightly towards Rafa. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I think you made some really good points there. Uh, and like I mentioned, these are things that I do want to see from Fritz. Uh, Nadal, of course, 3-3 three and three since Wimbledon. And has definitely not been the same player for reasons, of course. But then, uh, whatever those reasons are, we do know that on the court, he has been outplayed in his last three losses, especially uh, the most recent one where Tommy Paul just took the racket out of uh, Nadal's, Nadal's hands. Uh, so I think, do you, we know that Taylor Fritz, especially if uh, his loss is to, say, Gilles Simon recently and wants to Djokovic and Nadal in his uh, last Grand Slam matches against them are anything to go by is that he is not extremely clutch. He does, the moment does get to him. Uh, sure, he will, he kept it together quite well for most part in the Indian Wells final. Not uh, uh, Don't have any uh, uh, anything to say against that. But uh, yeah, he needs to be, don't you think he needs to be a bit more clinical and maybe a bit fearless and not let the occasion get to him, especially when, uh, say, he does have an upper hand in this match? Yeah, especially, I think it was... Uh... <laughs> Difficult uh, circumstances for him in those majors, uh, being in a fifth set against uh, against Djokovic, um, obviously who was struggling with his abdominal injury there, and then being in a fifth set against Nadal and having chances to put it away. I mean, those are some of the biggest matches you're going to play in your life, right? Uh, you know, getting to a second week of a major or getting to a semifinal of Wimbledon where you have an actual chance to play for the championship match. So I think all of these things are probably were probably just swirling in his in his mind a little bit. I do also think um, Nadal tactically threw in a lot of different looks and mix things up uh, because he was injured and not feeling his best he wanted to try to finish off points quicker he wanted to go for the down the line forehand much earlier in rally, rally so we actually saw a more proactive version of nadal's particularly in that fifth set tiebreaker i would say that's one of the best tie breaks i've ever seen nadal play like from start to finish his forehand was just deadly uh that day yeah. uh, in the tie break so i i, I do it think was, yeah. um you know fritz has to be a little bit more opportune you're definitely right about that he needs to take his chances when they come um, needs to be really bold and brave and go go after them um, and just like seize the occasion and be be fearless because that's what's gotten him here. Uh, the fearlessness is what stood out to me this year um, in other matches that he's played throughout his uh, Indian Wells run. You know, you think back to the matches he's played against Rublev this year, um, even matches against uh, or individual sets he's played against people like Medvedev and Tiafo and, you know, other sound players that he's beaten and to win his three titles. So I would say he should have a lot of confidence and belief, uh, and he's not just there as a as a number eight to just to, you know have fun and have a good time. He's here. I think he believes just like all the other seven players that he has a fair shot at winning this whole thing. So you have to have that mindset because that's the winning mindset. And I think he he backs himself uh, for sure, and he's got a, uh, a a good base to go off of. You know, big ground strokes and big serving will take you far in indoor conditions. Um, I think it's it's a little less complicated. It simplifies your game, in my opinion. Right, and uh, just uh, learned that Nadal is the one who will kick things off in this match. He's he's won the toss selected to serve first. Uh, I should say, obviously, on a completely unrelated note, Pala Alpito is a really nice venue name, don't you think? Has a nice ring to it. Uh, we have yeah, the O2 really Arena. It has that ring of that iconic stadium, which obviously is really deserved and fitting for a tournament like this with the eight best players in the world. So Nadal yeah. is just uh, just to confirm you're using tennis TV as well, right? So if so that I am yes. I know that streams are sort of in unison. And uh, as as Nadal of right now, of Fritz is they're showing Fritz uh, walking to the baseline, getting in his return position. Uh, play is okay. about to start. Right. So uh, I guess I'm a few seconds ahead. I'll try not to spoil it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Nadal is just doing his old service ritual, getting ready, <laughs> going ritual. up to the baseline. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's got that neon bandana on today yep. and uh, black and green outfit. Both players are wearing green, actually. Fritz is Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I shape. kind of wish, I mean, you saw Felix's outfit, really nice, right? Very yeah. color-coordinated to the stadium. 
Felix is always MVP for best dressed. I can tell you that. He uh, no lies was there. extremely well blessed uh, yeah. during the gala as well. And uh, oh yes, the gala. Um, right. Right. I think it's fifteen love now for Nadal Fritz uh, with a I think backhand error of four and yeah. I would didn't really catch that. Uh, backhand error off the return. So Nadal fifteen love. Yep. I should say, like, a lot of people talking about how they should have changed up the colors for this tournament. It still maintains that light blue and white and black uh, color palette, uh, if you want to call it that. It used to be, I think, I don't know what color exactly back in, back when it was in, say, Shanghai, Houston before, I mean, was it in Houston before Shanghai? Was it somewhere else? I cannot Recall. Yeah, it was, was in it? it was in Houston, I want to say from 2003-2004. Yeah. And obviously mm-hmm. Roger Federer is still the only player to have won it at three different venues. You have Djokovic right. winning it at two, Zverev winning it at two. I cannot recall any other. I mean, not I cannot recall doesn't mean it's not happened. Probably someone like Pete Sampras or Boris Becker would have I think won it in different venues. Um yeah. But, of course Nadal yeah. looking to win this championship for the First time, one of the only titles that he hasn't won, big titles, I should say. Yep. Um, That's true. Uh, I have uh, no a good, idea. A good body it. serve, though. There. Uh, yes. Yeah. I think he's yeah. So far, you know, he started very much like this against Tommy Paul. So I don't want to be quick to judge. Um, yes, uh, he did. His hit, hit, hit serve did start to look a little bit better in that match as well. So if you're positive. Looking for a positive yep. as an adult fan. That's definitely one. Yeah. Uh, we'll see if he has the endurance and physical stamina to go if this match goes the distance, you know? How does he hold yep. up physically? That's what I'm also interested mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. And That's obviously, true. we saw Felix here uh, this morning, and he was a debutant at this event. So I'm curious mm-hmm. to see if yep. uh, that has any additional nerves also, being playing here for the first time. Yeah. Oh, a good forehand down the line from Nadal yeah, to win the first game. Yeah, I did mention on you know the space that John himself hosted for talking tennis on Twitter that uh, you know I'm just curious to see how uh, Felix responds to this sort of uh, situation that he's in. Never really before has he played so many uh, you know top ten players or top eight yeah top eight players successively yeah. or put in this position. Um, so, I mean, today, it, it's funny because he's, his campaign started exactly like how Medvedev's against Sitsipa started three years ago. Same score, yeah. same kind of, I think, first set was uh, neck-to-neck. Not really much to decide the two. Second set, Medvedev had his chances. Sitsipa's more clutch. Same year with Rude. He quickly fell off 30 down after breaking, but did well to hold. And he just saw through that match. Um yeah, really I was impressed by Rude. Uh, obviously plays the loser of this match. Right. And that would be on Tuesday. Yes, it would be on Tuesday. Uh, obviously, I think it depends on it, whether or not Nadal wins this, that you know that match would be scheduled. If Nadal does lose, I think that would be the second match. Yeah. Of the uh, Let me just get a good score. serve down the tee for Fritz to start off here. Um, you know, actually, that is one of, I should have also said, that is Fritz's best serve, the one down the yeah. tee on the deuce side, in my opinion. Oh, yes. That one really well. Yeah, um, and, he, and he can also throw in those, uh, you know, slice serves from the deuce side. It can yeah. be really lethal. That uh, is, uh, that so that is key against better. Nadal. I think Nadal's two biggest rivals, Federer and Djokovic, of course, mm-hmm. uh, they've used that serve very smartly against him uh, on hard courts, and it's paid dividends. Yep. Uh, a couple of free points um, here for Fritz. Yeah, this is yeah. Uh, this is what Fritz can do. He has really good. When I mean, he gets in a rhythm on his serve going, yep. can be tough to read where he's going as well. So he's going to want to yep. mix it up as much as he can because that's one of his strengths. So we have with us Jane. She says hi and she's loving Rafa's kit. So uh, obviously, that's you, a Jane. very divided opinion. Uh, <laughs> no. I, I think uh, it's these are good. This is a good color for him uh, in these conditions with the backdrop and blue. Yeah, 
safe to say. I mean, it does blend with the scoreboard. I'll say that. But um, yeah, but yeah, I'm not sure if I like it personally. But yeah, I mean, it definitely I do... pops on the screen. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, always. I mean, he's a he's a neon head, right? All of his yeah. Like, he, he loves bright colors. Uh, but I would say he yeah uh, he. He he likes pink. He likes neon. Those are some of the most famous ones. He also has that all black look at the U.S. Open, which I always like. Two easy holds so far. Yeah, love holds. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is the. The court has slowed down a little bit, yes, but again, the same dynamics as we saw last year. Nothing much different, really. Um, yeah, it, it's tough to stop for the returner when you're serving well. It is, yes. Uh, um, just funny because uh, last year, what was interesting for me was Djokovic dropped both of his opening service games in the first two matches. It was Rudy and Rublev. He went down a break yeah. pretty quickly. Uh, someone like him, yeah, I kind of see. He's not, so, sometimes he, he does have slow starts, though, no back. Uh, I would yeah. say amongst the big three would be this Federer, really Djokovic, good. and then Nadal, like the best front runners. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was uh, on that last point, uh, for mm -hmm. Nadal to go up 15 love, that was a good example of Fritz using his cross court backhand, stretching Nadal yep. to his forehand, Nadal having to go to the squash shot. But this time he was actually quick enough, Rafa. He was able to get back to the middle on time. And then use his backhand cross court, take that early, and yes. make Fritz move because Fritz is not nearly as comfortable running uh, mm -hmm. into the outer thirds. He's improved that, but it's still not, I would say, uh, the very elite of the elite can still uh, expose that part mm -hmm. of his game. So that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nadal just missing there on the forehand. I'm like, a little bit of a yeah. so central like the second point that's gone against the server. Um, yeah. Uh, but so far, his service motion looks better than what it did at the U.S. Open. I think U.S. Open, it was sort of, uh, he was tossing it. The ball toss was a little bit lower to me. And it was also a little bit more out in front. He was using more slice. So uh, um, probably some adjustments that he made in preparation. So far, it looks back to the old motion. So that's perhaps a good thing. A good second serve there, but a really good return by Fritz. And now a really good cross court backhand. Nadal using his slice backhand. And they're in a cross court exchange. Nadal just overcooking the forehand long. So it's 15 30. 15 30, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. A couple of very good returns by Fritz here in this game so far. Yeah. You know, it's some of the important points, I think it's best for you to sort of take us through because I am a point ahead uh, okay. and I don't I don't think I want to spoil it for you. So, you know, the mic's yours there. Uh, so, yeah, 2-1 for Nadal in the head-to-head. -head. Yes. Obviously, 1-1 one and one in hard courts. Acapulco 2020 final, Nadal winning 6-3, 6-2. Of course, the 2022 Indian Wells final, Taylor Fritz winning 6-3, 7-6. And, you know, the other match that they did play was on grass uh, at Wimbledon, the quarterfinal. Nadal coming back from two sets to one down, winning in the fifth set tiebreaker, you know, despite being yeah. compromised physically. Uh, was on the verge of calling it quits, I should say. Yes, um, his team and everyone around him was telling him to stop playing. Yes. Um, and then, of course, he had to pull out of the semifinal against Kyrgios right after that. Thirty all second serve is where I'm at right now. Yeah, interesting. Uh, let's see what happens. Oh, and that's this is another pattern that Fritz is really starting to do a lot better on, which is taking his forehand early, pinning players behind the baseline, and then looking to finish on the short ball. And he's not necessarily finishing by coming to the net, but he's finishing by just hitting it lethally to the open space, but giving himself enough margin, as you can see with that inside-in forehand. 
Yeah. And Nadal was not even close to recovering there. Yeah, he was not. Uh, one more thing, a uh, minor detail to add to the excitement of this tournament is that there's no electronic lines calling. So we still have that anticipation for right. Hawkeye reviews, um, especially on tense points. Uh, yes. There was one in uh, in the first match, Rude uh, serving down the down the T or up the T. I want to say at four three game point, right? Catching the line by a fraction of a millimeter. It, I mean, it was that close. Um, Nadal like just Robbie challenging Cole, his so. first serve uh, at break point down, and he just missed that. So second serve mm-hmm. break point. He chooses to go out wide. Fritz with the backhand return cross court. Nadal with the forehand line, and then Fritz misses the forehand cross. So we yes. are at and deuce. deuce. And we see Morgan Riddle there, and then we see Mike Russell, his fitness yeah. coach. Yeah, Morgan Riddle, of course, uh, very famous yeah. on TikTok and and um, tennis Twitter. Yes, uh, yes, and tennis Twitter, and yeah, quite a celebrity, I would say, in the tennis world now. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Nadal missing his first serve again. Uh, chooses to go down the tee. Nadal using his inside out forehand. The rally resets. Fritz goes cross court with his backhand, and then he has a forehand which he pulls the trigger on, tries to go inside out, misses it just long. So, game point now. Yes. So far, Nadal is trying very hard to resist the offensive barrage that Fritz is throwing at him. And if he can get out of this game, this would be big. Nice wide serve, but Fritz has the answers with a good return. Yeah, I mean, I should say Nadal is... Uh, I don't want to say it too early, but he's serving well. <laughs> it's just the third game of the match. But, yeah. man. This game is taking the... Guys. Returns early, especially on his backhand, like we saw in that point. Yep. And that time, Fritz actually was coming forward. So he goes backhand line, kind of central, but Nadal misses the pass. So we're at yeah. deuce. Nadal with the white serve, first serve, and he gets a free point and he fist pumps. Yep. Fritz, a little disappointed he didn't make that return. We have another yep. game point. So far, this game has gone on over seven minutes. Uh, yeah, there's this one guy in the crowd who's wearing a neon sweatshirt. <laughs> yep. It's really sticking out. Big serve down the tee for Nadal there. That's maybe the fastest I've seen. That was around 205. Yeah, in a while, yes. In a while, yes. Um, yes, so that's uh, encouraging. He saved a break point, got through a seven-minute game, and he held. So we're at 2-1. But, uh, yeah, I yeah, think I mean, this tournament is interesting. I mean, it's. I love the fact that it's round robin. Uh, it seems like a very... Good field this year, even with Alcaraz not playing. Right, that's true. Uh, they're just currently showing a graphic which Nadal is 5,820 points. And we have with us, uh, and we have joined with us, uh, Miles David from the Missing the Point podcast. Oh, there uh, he is. How are you, Miles? Hey, good afternoon, guys. Is that fair I to say? I asked him for lunch. Uh, you could say <laughs> yes. good evening for me. <laughs> okay, good, good afternoon, good evening, guys. You don't really greet someone by saying good night. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, How are you guys doing? We're good. We are, are we? We're doing good. 
Good, good, good. I I watched the first uh two holds of serve and I just saw Nadal get out of some trouble there. So I am right on time. Yep, you are perfect. Uh, you haven't us, missed a uh, whole you know, lot. Um, yeah, you joined us just uh, you know, at the best time. You possibly could really. Uh the first couple of games, just you know, one way traffic, no point against the server. The previous game was quite interesting. You could see uh, you know, some of the things that Fritz was doing uh, to really trouble Nadal. Nadal also serving his way out of trouble. Uh, you know, a few times there, the break point save and the last two points, all, um, you know, either four unforced errors from Fritz or unreturned serves. Um, so, yeah. What I don't like that Tennis TV does is just like switch to this court level camera angle. I don't know why they do that. I'm not how sure long, about you, Miles. Like, do how you long like that? Stay on that court level? What was that? How long do they actually stay on that court level view? It's usually a point or two, but it's really annoying because they do that on crucial or interesting points. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I kind of like it. It reminds me of when I used to play um, uh, top spin tennis on like the throwback Xbox oh. or PlayStation. I like the right. different variations of a camera angle during a tennis match. It's, it's kind of boring. You know, like on some of the some of the ATP 250s, we get like almost like a... a, a a, a blimp or something view and that's how it stays the entire time i don't like that as much as the variation of the different court angles that's just that's just personal preference right it's an interesting perspective uh yeah uh, i think what they should do and i'm assuming technology's evolved enough for this maybe give the user the preference as to what view they want to use Ooh. yeah that, that'd be super interactive especially if you're like mm -hmm. a tennis nerd yeah for sure yeah, uh, yeah. This kind of, I mean, uh, you mentioned topspin four. I played Virtua Tennis four for on the Xbox with that Kinect sensor, and this is the kind of camera angle you would get. But I mean, that's different, right? You're, it's a very uh, what do you call f uh, first term basis sort of uh, mm -hmm. perspective that you have there. It's like you are playing uh, against the opponent here. It's like I mean, even though you're controlling it. Uh, it's better that you have the entire court to look at. But. Are, are they still showing that? Because I'm broadcasting, I'm streaming tennis channels coverage, and uh, I'm pretty sure for it, I'm pretty sure it's the same coverage, just licensed for tennis channels. Yeah, it's the same coverage. coverage. Yeah, uh, it's, the, it's the world feed. They're just using it with different broadcasters and stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty true. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am a point ahead of lunch. I'm not sure about you what's the score for you at this point i'm looking at 40 30 fritz uh have a has a point oh, okay. to hold at one two oh, okay yes i'm at 40 15 fritz serving okay. i think once uh does it say go live um on your stream maybe you could click that and probably behind by a point oh well actually yeah uh, now i'm a deal so <laughs> right so i went from 40 because i'm also deuce. using tennis tv and it shouldn't there shouldn't be that much of a difference so that's i would, cool. yeah, I yeah. would just blame it on the san diego vibes you guys have good vibes over there everything's a little a little slower and cooler and calmer that's all <laughs> yeah i will i will happily take the blame for that <laughs> yeah so it's deuce uh and fritz with an ace down the t yeah. set up game so point far. Three aces for Fritz so far this match. Yeah, so, it's that served on the tee from the deuce side, really. Like, he just gets it. Yeah, Would you say, Fritz, it's his best serve. who do you think needs to, or I'm asking both of you guys, who do you think needs to kind of settle into this match earlier? I mean, I know Nadal just faced some break points, but this is Fritz's first time ever playing this event, and this is Nadal's third match since the U.S. Open? Second match since the U.S. Open? Second match. Second match, yes. Yeah. So he's I a little say bit Fritz, of honestly. Um, you would say Fritz? Yes, because Nadal still has so much experience with him. And Fritz, uh, of course, uh, obviously he is a top of, top flight player at this moment. But playing someone like Nadal, you still, you know, any, anybody. You would take guys like back in the day, Burditch, Songa, and Ferrer, even though they were veterans at that point, it was still important for them to. Uh, you know, get uh, start to dictate proceedings early and get settled in the match quicker mm -hmm. than their opponent because they know that their opponents can still play from behind. Nadal, especially this year, he's played quite a few matches from behind and he's come out as the victor. There was that match at the U.S. Open against Fonini. He was down a set in a break. 
he pulls through that one. Uh, there was the Australian Open final, of course, which everybody remembers. So, so Fritz, yes, I would say it's definitely important. If he, if the match does start to get away from him, let's say there's a close first set and Nadal takes it, I definitely see Fritz fading away. But if the reverse were to happen, Nadal is still going to be, uh, you know, all over Fritz. He's going to try to. Uh, uh, he, you know, he's he's going to try to make inroads every single game. He's not going to let the scoreboard affect him much. But I would say, you know, that's the opposite for Fritz. Yeah, Nadal hitting a really good forehand down the line there, which is of course what he needs to do to break that pattern that we were talking about earlier, yeah. Shahari. With the I know, love the lefty hook. Crackhead. I'm a sucker for a lefty hook out wide on the serve. Yeah, it is. It's quite a good serve to have in your arsenal <laughs> as a lefty. You know, to really get the returner stretched out wide and. Just that angle that you're able to get as a lefty, it's really uh, quite advantageous in tennis. I see Steven asked a question, who's the first alternate, Hubie or Holger? That's a good question because I don't know the answer, but it, it does make Holger. me think Holger is the first alternate? It is. Yeah, the, yeah it is Holger. Um, it makes me think about, I wonder how much house money Taylor Fritz is playing with because technically he shouldn't be in this first match. He should be one of the alternates. So I wonder how that plays, um, you know, psychologically on his ability to kind of swing free, which it looks like he's doing pretty, pretty well enough in the first couple of games. Yeah. It's interesting that combined with the experience he has against Rafa this year in two really big matches, right? In the Indian Wells final and Wimbledon quarterfinal, uh, you know, he, he really wants to get off to a good start here, at least get one set on the board, especially when you're a debutante. It kind of just releases that pressure. I mean, we saw, um, you know, that first set between Felix and Rude really could have gone either way this morning. And yeah, uh, Felix being a debutante as well, and he faced some nerves in that tie break, which got the better of him. So I'm interested to see as this match gets closer, how does Fritz handle that occasion? Because, of course, Nadal has been here many times. This is his 11th appearance at the World Tour Finals. And... Um, that number sounds surprisingly low. It is, yeah, because he's quali- obviously he's qualified every single year since two thousand five, and he's never left. The he hasn't. Al- he hasn't always played. Yes, yeah, he just hasn't sense. played because of yeah. yeah, he's been injured uh, a lot of the times. So, yeah, um, like he didn't play this last event last year, or um, last he played it was twenty twenty when he served for the semifinal. Um, didn't Vaj, you mentioned that. you mentioned the doll's injuries, and I've just been. Um, I've been kind of like doing some Twitter research about Nadal's injuries or when he goes public with the injuries. And I know you guys both have a healthy amount of respect for Djokovic, but it seems like a lot of the conversation around Nadal's injuries or when he pulls out or when he's asked about them, the conversation shifts somehow to some people thinking he does that to kind of negate the fact that his opponent played well or to kind of take the pressure off to, to take the, accolade from his opponent do you guys think that is like that is somehow in his in his toolbox to kind of blame injuries or use injuries as a crutch i don't look at it like that but i see a lot of people have that perspective so i'm just wondering where you guys fall on it um i wouldn't say so really uh but i mean that that being said i do think he does bring them up quite a bit uh especially I mean, obviously, this is more me being a Djokovic fan, but I think it would still be, uh, it would still be the case if I were neutral or supporting another player. But I think he mentioned the injury at RG Twenty One a bit too much, even uh, as uh, as recent as the Indian Wells Twenty Twenty Two, I think press conference. He mentioned that he couldn't climb down the stairs. At that point, it was what March of Twenty Twenty Two. He's talking about a match that happened in June of 2021. I just felt like, you know, he he knows that that match was so significant, but, you know, he did talk about it quite a bit. I mean, I'm not obviously not even contesting the fact that he did, you know, get injured. It, but although it was towards the end of the match, uh, which I think in a way it enables his fans to sort of uh, resort to narratives such as, oh, Nadal, he's a he fighter, when he yeah, is, he's a fighter uh, and pushes packs. He pushes yeah, packs. Not at 100%. It. He definitely does, especially when pretty much every match that he's lost, at least this year, I would say that he's pointed to some uh, injury or the other. Even uh, the match lost against Tiafo, it's... Uh, you know, he, it's did, he didn't look 100% at all. 
he didn't look yes of course but yeah. uh it's just for me when you mention it rather than mentioning it itself i don't have a problem like if you are not 100 percent, and obviously these players do a really good job of masking it say sitsipas for example last year who would have thought that he was struggling with his elbow that much that he had to undergo surgery immediately right i did watch him practice against medvedev in turin uh that video obviously is on tennis tv i did share it recently he he looked completely 100 percent uh, you wouldn't think his uh, elbow needed immediate nursing but at the same time for me it just depends on when uh, uh you know the timing of such comments and like the way you say it too i'm not saying that that's not to say that nobody ever talks about uh you know their injuries when they do end up losing you know to cite that as a reason but it's just like the frequency and the timing for me but i don't think he's doing that to like take credit away it's just rather uh I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure why exactly is the psychology behind it. Maybe for him to feel better in a way, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that's fair. I've just been seeing it a lot lately, especially because of Nadal talking about like his abs and stuff like that in the past couple of past couple of months and stuff. But that's fair. That's a fair assessment. Yeah, for me in general, I just try to stay out of the injury discourse uh, that happens, especially between Djokovic and Nadal fans. Like, you know. You know, insinuating that one spicy. of the others faking an injury <laughs> or cheating or doping. I just don't really like to get into all that. I just like to see, like, just oh evaluate what the player says at the press conference, what I see with my own eyes while watching the match. And then if I really do see that injury played a factor, like, for instance, in an Indian Wells final, you could really see that the dog wasn't right physically, right? The, the dog and Fritz, yeah. And, and Fritz, and they were both injured, and Fritz was playing with a numb, and, you know, he had his foot... Um, treated on by a doctor or a paramedic like four hours before the yeah match, TT he just like, loves to uh, uh you know assume uh complete knowledge uh regarding injuries of athletes especially i mean tennis players in this uh, case because did uh, you say tt no not talking tennis <laughs> You made tennis, tennis footer, right? I thought yes. so. Right, right. I mean, I mean, you. I know you know, uh, but you know, just for <laughs> yes, uh, it's just for, for those watching us. Obviously, we we you know term tennis Twitter as um, under this huge umbrella called TT, just uh, you know an abbreviation that we use. Um, but yeah, I think they just do that too much, especially with the, you know that's around the time when Netflix announced that they're working on a tennis documentary. Which right? it's 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 kind of time for them to kind of hurry up and drop something there. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, about it for yeah. quite a I'm while. I'm not looking forward to it. If Naomi Osaka's documentary is anything to go by, I'm not looking forward I, to that. I love because... Naomi, but that was a bit of a snooze fest, and I've had yeah. I've had I've had <laughs> yeah, zero. I mean, you do have a similar opinion. He yeah. did not like. I watched a bit of it. I did not like it at all. Felt. A lot, a lot of stuff that see, it, I love Naomi so stuff. much that I didn't want to turn it off in the middle of one of the episodes, so I just started playing it at 1.5 or two speed just so I could <laughs> finish it because I, I already knew everything, you know, I already knew about the Coco Goff and US Open, you know, uh, the match that they played in the interview afterwards and all the information. Like, I think we, we're more like hardcore fans, right? So we're, mm -hmm. we're aware of all this stuff and her backstory and and all of that, but. Maybe it's good, like for other casual fans, so like get into yeah, the game and I see. Yeah, I think it's good exposure. I think it's very good exposure for the sport. Taylor Fritz has two great points to go four three up. Oh yeah. Yep. So, lunch if you want to take us through this point. Yes. Um, yeah. Previous point fifteen thirty. Uh, Fritz we'll uh, hits a back deep backhand return, forces a shank, and now fifteen forty. I think. Yeah, 1540 is where I'm at right now. Shanks are so frustrating. <laughs> so frustrating. A couple of break points. Let's see what Nadal does. He goes wide on the first serve. He gets a short forehand and he hits it in the open court. Fritz misses the backhand bunt. So now we're at 3040. So one break point save. Nadal saved a, his first break point in the third game of the match. If that was Djokovic and he, he was lining up for that shot, my heart would have literally stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because of the overhead thing? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> he finds a way to bungle up the easy, easier <laughs> shot in the game. Really, like, that's a talent. Like, you really need to go up to 30, 40. I think someone made a compilation of it on tennis Twitter, and I, I had a healthy laugh at it. Very helpful. Yeah, painful. <laughs> and Fritz misses the backhand on the line, and it's. Uh, yeah, he had it perfectly set up there. Uh, yeah, the forehand cross, and Nadal using the slice, just getting it a little bit out of Fritz's contact point, 
Uh, it's a good tactic. Definitely worked at, at Wimbledon in some of the big points. Nadal looked way more uh, just dialed in mentally into like the the battle of this match more than I've seen him. Definitely in the Tiafo in the later stages of the Tiafo match and overall yeah. altogether in that match against Tommy Paul and the Paris Masters. So he definitely looks like he's ready for the fight. Yes, uh, that's yeah, what I you do agree. See if you're a fan um, of his. I didn't want to. I, I I tried shying away from making this comment in the third game because it was still too early. We saw that against Tommy Paul. He was quite clinical for most of the first set. Looked like it was, you know, just another... Oh, and that's a win perfect win point there for three. Nadal Adios. Yep. Uh, it's doing exactly what he does best with his forehand, just maneuvering Fritz around the court. Yeah. Using really good angle. Uh, it does look really like, good you know, this is the their fourth meeting, but finally looks like we're getting two really good versions of them because... The Acapulco match was one-sided, right? Fritz mm -hmm. was not nearly as good as he is right now. Uh, the last two matches that they played, one or both players were just hindered by injuries. So here it looks like they're at you know 100 percent uh, and coming up with some really good shots as well. So this matchup should be interesting. I'm and interested to see Alcohol. how well this court takes the topspin um, and how effective that is because we saw in the first match. It was able to do some damage. Uh, the heavy shots from Rude and the RPMs he was getting, I think Nadal uh, is using that so far well as so he helps for four three. Yeah, two really big games for Nadal to get out of trouble on his serve. Yeah, I feel like Fritz should be kicking himself as to not be up a break just about yet. I mean, Nadal played those points very well, but he still had, what, maybe four or five break points at this point, and he hasn't converted any. So he's probably thinking about it, especially if more come up in the next Nadal service game. He's going to be thinking about it for sure. Yeah. Three of them so far. I think on one of those, he had a very good look at a backhand, and he just missed it. So he was kicking himself after that point. Sorry, Fritz. Yeah, we were coming back to the Naomi Osaka documentary yes. discourse. I will actually have to go and get some food really quick. I'll be right yeah. back. Enjoy so it, I'll be back soon. Yep. I think it's good exposure all the way around. I mean, at, at this point in where we stand in tennis, in the sport of tennis, I don't normally say this, but I feel like any kind of exposure is good exposure, especially with the retirement of Roger and Serena in the past couple of months. There's definitely and I, 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 this phrase has been like used at nauseum, but changing of the guard in, in tennis. But like now it's like actually happening. Nadal looks even though he looks, you know, fairly into it in this match. It almost feels to me that at any point he could be like, you know what? These injuries are coming in way too quick and persistent for me to travel around the globe and play this sport I love. Plus having a growing family. I wouldn't blame him if, if he if he called it quits at any given time. He's he deserves that, right? Um yes. and now we're we're looking at we're looking at new players that the general public, not just not just hardcore fans like you and I, but the general public don't have any kind of not any, but not much of an attachment one way or the other. So if we were to build villains or heroes or somewhere in between, I think that'll be good for the sport moving forward in the next five to ten years because we need it. We definitely yes. need it. Definitely. Um, yeah, obviously there are a few uh, negative aspects to that, which is we saw it with F1. Uh, and I, I do not watch F1 at all. I don't know if you... Me either. Okay. Right. I don't even know what it stands for. What does the F stand for? Formula One. <laughs> Formula One. There we go. Okay. Uh, right. I mean, you probably know as much as I do anyway. Uh, although I've watched a bit of it, you know, many years ago, I've just, you know, never really had that interest anymore. But um, yeah, there was a document that came out and then invited a lot of like fans we call casuals. Um, and we know how irritating casuals can be. Casuals, locals, all of these people, right? Completely misinformed. And then they start having these takes that sound like they're established on a lot of facts and established on so much experience of them but truly aren't watching the sport. But like, yeah, it's just nothing really. Like they see a few things out of context and they start acting like experts. Uh, so yeah, this India Wells final was around the time when it was announced, the, the Netflix documentary. And then when Taylor Fritz, um, he called off his practice in three minutes and he didn't think he would even play. And he comes out on court, he plays, you know, the first four games really well. I think he went four love up. 
uh, in that match pretty quickly. And it, Nadal fans were so quick to call him out and say, oh, yeah, this guy said he was injured before the match too. Uh, you know, and he was playing possum and all of that. But then he looks 100% to me, uh, which, I mean, I don't know why Nadal fans would say that, especially because uh, you should know a thing or two about, you know, trying to hide injuries, right? A player trying to hide injuries and playing through it. They champion Nadal for doing that. They say, oh, well, you know, which I, I think it's, uh, uh, maybe you agree with me, but I don't think it's a very healthy mindset to praise players for playing through injuries and really risking them. Uh, mm -hmm. We saw that uh, when Medvedev retired right, against Djokovic. Uh, I never I never did my research on that match. I, 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 saw, I don't know where I was mentally, like, but I know that Medvedev retired under some questionable circumstances but i never went back to watch the highlights or the full match so i'm not 100 percent sure what happened. right it was uh i think it was five all or yeah five all in the second set tiebreaker medvedev's up a set uh and he sort of pulls his adductor muscle and he feels like okay and he also struggled to serve i remember that you know it was six uh, Djokovic was six five he served for it and I think he lost that point and then he's but he you know went up seven six and Medvedev lost and he was like okay I cannot continue I don't want to risk this further everyone was like oh but if you know, you know this uh, this goes you know this goes to say how much of a champion Nadal is because he's played through so many more injuries more se severe ones and uh also come through them so many times which I I don't know why they brought that up even and I don't think that's something you should be praising a player for uh, I mean, if that's what they want to do, great. But mm -hmm. that it's it's unfair to set that as some sort of gold standard for other players. Yeah, looks like Nadal is about to have an easy hold, and he does ace out wide five four in the first set. Pretty high level so far. Not too bad. I just I just think in general because um, I've had I've had this conversation too. I've, I've heard people be on very interesting sides of the spectrum as far as like not even caring too much about players injuries almost to sound like well you signed up to be a professional athlete just go out and deal with it and it kind of dehumanizes them in a way i personally think that tennis is one of the most grueling things professional tennis and the way it's kind of set up is one of the most grueling things you can do on your body i mean you're going from different countries different locations week to week to week Having people that you, I mean, some people are lucky enough to travel with consistent physios, but sometimes other people are not con uh, consistent enough with their physios. So you have different people like trying to get you in tune with your body and all kind of different supplements you have to carry with you throughout the entire globe. So if a player, for the most part, says they have an injury in this particular sport or withdraws for an injury or even uh does a precautionary withdrawal because they feel something happen i usually typically just go with it because the the standard person that has like a regular nine to five job would would believe that you know traveling around the globe seems wonderful yes in some aspects but not when you have to go out and play upwards of two and a half three hours matches and then get right back on a plane shortly afterwards it's just a lot it's just grueling and i kind of give tennis players um, the benefit of the doubt when it comes to that, especially towards the end of a season, it's just a lot to go through. Yeah, really good points you make there. And we have our usual uh, spectator here, Ghost. Uh, Ghosty. Lord yeah. Stefano's being, becoming world number one. Stefano's yeah. would have to, he'd have to win their entire event, right? And I think there's Unbeaten. one little circumstance. Yes. Yeah, and then the group yeah. he is in. Um, group of death to... He's, in the, he's in the Djokovic, Rublev, and Medvedev group, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I know, right? Like, uh, yeah, I'm gonna remove this comment for a bit because bunch is hidden. Oh, okay. Fritz, where have they changed that banner? All right. Um, yes, actually, I am okay. back, guys, and I am right. getting nourished at the same time with some really nice lentils and rice that my mom yeah. made. So. Yeah, I mean, Fritz so far quite uh, comfortable on serve. A uh, couple of easy holds since Nadal saved those two break points, looks like. Yep. Yep. I think he, he just held it love to go up 5 4. So nothing too crazy. Kind of what I expected in a, in a way. Um, at this point, like you, like you mentioned earlier, at this point that we're getting. Uh, a level from both of them where they kind of know what to expect and that's 
kind of shown in the fact that they've both held serve consistently with a few hiccups on the doll side. But well, did he make that? Did Fritz make that backhand? Missed it. He missed it. Just why? Wow. Yeah. It's 30 15. Fritz serves out uh, wide, backhand, backhand in the open court. So, uh, right. 40 15 for Fritz. 4 5 on serve. Obviously, Fritz is the, is the player who's had three break points. Uh, one in the third game, the other in the seventh. Uh, Nadal pretty much. Uh, there was one backhand down the line that Fritz should have made, but not that would have guaranteed him the point. But uh, you know, the other two definitely saved by Nadal uh, with some really good play. One was an unreturned serve, and the other, I think, he forced an error from Fritz. Second serve, forty fifteen. Some of this, some of these Fritz forehands are a bit shaky. Looks out of balance, mm -hmm. but makes them. Yeah. Uh, Right, there's a cross court exchange and a Something neutral that ball. And Fritz his coaches misses, uh, inside out forehand. It's a bit of a smirk. So it's 40 30, 4 5 on Fritz's serve. Am I audible right now? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was stuck on Ghost of Gerolitis' comment about uh, add some okra and crawdaddies. Ghost of Gerolitis, where are you from? It sounds very uh, Southern Louisiana-ish. <laughs> I'm from yeah. there. I'm I'm from there. So that's when you said uh, add some some okra and crawdaddies. Piqued my interest a little bit. <laughs> I mean, okra is a really uh, popular vegetable here in India, both north and south. Um, it was the crawdaddies. I don't I don't think is our crawfish popular in India. Oh, add some I okra and crawdaddies and corn and celery and kajun spice. Okay, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the dirty, dirty. I it, like to see it. It's, I guess, answers your question without answering it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you don't know what you don't know what crawdaddies are. No, I don't actually. Have you heard of crawfish? Yeah. Oh, it's Same those. Thing. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Hmm? You're telling a vegan, so I'm like. <laughs> You can be uh, no, you can't. Never mind. You can can you be uh, vegan? No, you can't. Never mind. You can't. Vegan is just plant based. Yes. You know, so, uh, yeah. Southern boy originally, and now I'm in the southwest. Well, that's oh. something in common. I'm also from the southern part of India. If that's anything to go by, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's five all in the first set. Uh, Fritz did eventually hold. Um, looked like he was in a bit of danger. You know, second serve as well. In that final game point, but managed to you know get himself back even. That's five all. Nadal serving fifteen love. This is so minute, but um, Taylor Fritz's shoes are really starting to bother me. They don't. They go. <laughs> they go with absolutely nothing he has on, <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I should say Nike's outfits have been <clears throat> although interesting, a lot better than the absolute. Uh, train wrecks that Adidas has come up with. Remember, <laughs> yeah, the one, the their collection uh, with the, with the um, collection, like from February blurry, to March. The blurry questionable pants. shorts color. Yeah, the shorts, the shorts <laughs> with the blurry stain on the on the on the rear end. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely it was funny. I did. I got so many jokes out of that, especially <laughs> when you know someone who was wearing Adidas would uh, lose a match from a really clutch position. Uh, could like say, oh yeah, they crap their pants, and they that lost. sounds like sounds like Zverev to me. But hey. Zverev, yeah, I use that on <laughs> Zverev especially. It was uh, that match he lost to Tommy Paul, right? It was seven six in the third in Indian Wells. Indian Wells, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, I miss Indian Wells. I'm gonna try to go to Indian Wells or Miami next year. Yeah, I've been there only once in 2019. I had fun. Um, we watched, uh, you know, Djokovic against Fred Angelo, and Pete Sampras was in the stands. Although I didn't like see him. Saw him in the big screen, and obviously Sampras being Djokovic's idol, my dad's huge idol as well. He's a really big Pete Sampras fan. Um, yeah, Nadal holds for six five, comfortable too. Uh, Nadal's serve really looks back to where it was. I would say before the he's US cranking game. it, he's cranking it and finding the angles for sure. That outside serve is um, that out wide serve, excuse me, is working for him for sure. Yeah, I mean he, his toss looks. Position, positioning wise, his toss, toss looks a little bit higher and it's more or less back to normal. Like it has some more juice under it, I would say. Um, yep. 
And he's averaging, his averaging is are looking pretty good. He's averaging like around 120 on the first serve, around 103 on the second. So those are pretty good numbers. And he just hit three aces in a row. Interesting uh, question I want to <laughs> ask you guys, because I've heard different opinions on it from tennis channel commentators or just broadcasters in general. What do you guys feel like is Taylor Fritz's best wing, his backhand or his forehand? I'd say backhand. His backhand to me has always been one of the best in uh, amongst the American men, he has this like precision on it. Um, he's able to hit it consistently cross court. Like it's, it's able. He's able to find that good bite and angle, and especially on a faster surface, it really skids through. And he can also change very well with it down the line. And it just seems very compact and you know easy on the eye. His forehand, he can actually look quite uh, like unbalanced with it. Like it really depends on where his movement is at because when he's like stretched or he's like trying to defend with it. Um, his explosive movement can be something exploited by the best players, particularly when he's running to his forehand. But um, his forehand has actually improved quite a bit. I would say that's maybe the big thing that's improved in the last 15 months for Taylor. Just I, how, how much he really goes after that wing. Like now, I anything think, short that you leave, he's going to attack. Off that I forehand. think I give him the, un, like the unfortunate... I put him in the unfortunate box of where most of America's men's tennis has been the past couple of years, which is good serve and good forehand. Cause I don't, when I think of Taylor Fritz, I do not think of his backhand yet. I guess I need to watch more matches because in, from when I think about the Indian Wells victory, I think about a lot of um, um, kind of floaters in the middle of the court that he put away with bomb forehand. So I have to watch him yeah. a little bit more to see about that backhand, but we'll see what he does to stay in this set. It's five, six. Oh, yeah, Nadal's his commitment on that forehand wing. Whoa, what a backhand smash from Nadal and a pretty big fist pump signature Rafa. Love 15. This could be interesting. Three points away from the first set. Yeah, and a really good scramble as well to get to him. I was just about to say that, Vaughn. He's still the king of scrambling. Up, up and back, side to side. He, he just makes scrambling look like second nature. Yeah. He still has a pretty quick first step. He's yep. able to sprint and get to those short balls. Nadal's turning 37 next Roland Garros, right? Yeah. Yep. 15 all. Mm, interesting. This is one thing I actually like about a lot of these American men now. It used to be a big serve, big forehand. You know, your John Isner and your Sam Querrey types. But mm -hmm. now you have players like Tommy Paul, Francis Tiafo, Taylor Fritz, Brandon Nakashima, like, um, you know, Brooksby, like other players. Their backhands are quite strong. You know, they're formidable, I would say. I still would take Nakashima's backhand over his forehand just from watching. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, the clips of the next gen finals, his backhand just looks more like the, the stroke that he doesn't have to think about as much. Whereas the forehand, you can tell he's it's effective when he's timing it well, but he's, you can still tell he's thinking about where exactly he should be placing like his body on the forehand. But the backhand is just so sweet every single time. His backhand is up there with like the likes of Nishikori and Gofan, and like some of the very best players. I would say even now, like your Yannick Sinners and Medvedevs and Djokovic's and Zverev's. Is that an players. ace? Yes. And uh, we have a first set tiebreaker. Seems fitting. Very fitting. Yep. Really does. Right. Okay. Quick uh, predictions from the two of you. What do you think is happening in the, you know, in this tiebreaker? I think Nadal has momentum to take it out. I feel like Fritz um, shows his hand a little bit, meaning that he just he blinks a little bit in this in this uh, in this tiebreak. If anything, from the Felix debut tiebreak at the Nito ATP Finals, I think Taylor Fritz might blink. I'd be surprised if he doesn't, actually. I'm going to say Nadal as well. I think he's been a little bit better in this first set. Yeah, I think so, too. 
Uh, he's been more clutch. Of course, uh, Fritz has, uh, you know, sort of smooth sail on all of his service games, but he's still... And commentator Jinx right there, just as he double faults. <laughs> right. The fact that that actually happens, like, I, you would think that it would just be like a commentator, you know, a large-scale commentator, but it happens to us, too. Look at that. That's crazy. <laughs> At least he, at least he laughs, laughs it off, a la Sabalenka. <laughs> oh. Let me pull the match back here. All right, it's two love for Fritz. Also, this is a bit of a tangent, but um, Sabalenka hired a biomechanics specialist. Is that correct? Yeah, in the middle of the did, season. Right? Yeah. Yeah, again, Nadal not so great on the return, and you know he cannot afford points like that. Um, mm -hmm. just, Especially on the backhand side, that should be way more solid than that. Yeah, Fritz gets mix. him on the T serve again as Three he backs up. up. Yep, and this time it was on the forehand, so you know, just a return that he's usually very reliable to make. I'll just you know hook up my laptop to a power source. It's at twenty percent, and it's showing that leap, which gives me a bit of anxiety. So yeah. Ghosty asked, I wonder if Sabalenka's in love or something. Would we ask that same question to a guy if he all of a sudden had a better attitude? <laughs> <laughs> I think when I hear biomechanics, Ghosty, I think of using your body as efficiently as, efficiently as possible, which I feel like a lot of not to generalize but on the wt tour because because serving is such a um is depending on throwing and a lot of women's sports don't have throwing kind of naturally in it kind of like football or basketball or baseball um the women that's, this is what i've heard from people like navratilova speak about it um they don't have that natural throwing motion so i think that's when i think biomechanics comes in because if you remember uh richard williams when he was kind of you know molding venus and serena he would have them throw rackets up up and above the fence of the court and just throw footballs and stuff like that and a, a lot of women just don't naturally do that as they come up so that and that that shows itself under pressure moments as you know on their serve so that's just interesting hopefully she gets better with it though because I, I mean obviously the pace and stuff is there Yeah, served much better during the WTA finals. Yeah. Nadal netting a routine backhand. Yeah, 4 2 for Fritz. And this is interesting. Last year, there were a lot of tiebreakers. I remember Medvedev alone played five. In the oh round. my gosh. The thing I remember so much about last year's ATP finals was Medvedev's attitude towards his own serve. Like he was putting in two first serves almost consistently. There was that match point against Sinner. Like <laughs> yeah. five. Oh, wow, that was it a was goes that much. It worked, and but I was almost just, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what yeah, are you that doing? Dude, right after he's rackled, right? He's like applauding and he's like showing the sarcastic thumbs up. Uh, very Djokovic esque. Not that you would like particularly miles, but <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah, of course. I mean, that's that's totally fine. Uh, yeah, he it happened against Zverev too, and then Zverev also like it was the second set, however, and he started to use the crowd in his favor once Medvedev missed that forehand and he lost the set. Uh, but yeah, like Medvedev played five tiebreakers in the round robin, and the round played uh, at this tournament. Which the first match began with a tiebreaker, just one break of serve in that entire match. Three break points here, no break of no breaks of serve though. Taylor Fritz five two up, Nadal serving of course two five. His serve has gotten even thing. more accurate. Taylor Fritz. How many times have we seen Nadal in this kind of scenario, and he walks away with the set? The answer is a gazillion times. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> right away, I'm thinking to the U.S. Open 2019 semis against Berrettini. 
Ah, yes. You know, like there's just so many examples. He's been, he's down, been down in tie breaks, been down in mini break, finds his way out. First set this year against Zverev, the French Open. 6 2 down in the first yeah. set tie break. It's the next <laughs> yep. six points. Yep. And that was the one time I was actually happy he turned it around. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's like 3 5. For Nadal, missed forehand return, was it? No. Oh, no. Surf missed. No. Right. Oh, we're finally on the same point and same place. Yeah. See, I'm watching it on mute, and uh, I couldn't tell if Fritz missed that. Sometimes with body language, you could tell, but since it's such a small window that I have on here, probably missed a little detail. Okay. Forehand, Nadal forehand, inside out. Fritz gets the forehand back, backhand to Nadal's forehand on the line, which misses. And uh, Nadal very sort of deep backhand right there. Um, that's one thing that Fritz does really well is he forces a lot of errors with his backhand because he's able to get it so deep. Um, yes, his depth is and never lacking. Taylor Fritz has three set points, two on his own serve. Should be taking this at this point. Yes. Uh, um, he's got it on his own racket now, so. Yeah, this, as we speak, there were 30 really comments. And <laughs> if the, doll, using... the doll's classic hands on his hip is always funny to me. Always. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Nadal looks really off balance. And Fritz pumps the forehand down the line to take the first set 7 6. Yeah. And Wonderful inside end. He had to get out of yeah. the way a little bit, but Huge great draw and fist mm -hmm. pump as well. He knows that this set was important to get in the bag. And almost kind of not his in some ways. Like he, he created yeah, opportunity. Nadal obviously to challenging that forehand, which of course was in. I mean, that is probably the the most no consequence challenge you could ever see in tennis. Like he's lost the set. It's not like he loses the challenge and it affects him because the challenge is a reset the next set, right? Um, right. Just uh... so. Taylor Fritz's roars aren't the most photogenic I've seen from like ATP uh, media. So, something about them just don't look like a typical like tennis player roar. I have no idea how to quantify what a typical ATP roar looks like. I just think his looks different. That's all. <laughs> but good yeah. set for him nonetheless. Really good set. I have a question for both of you guys. Yes. Um, and it's based off of what happened in the WTA finals because we saw two players go 0 for 3 in both of their groups. Do you think anybody in the 8 are going to go 0 for 3 in their matches? Did, or did anybody go 0 for 3 last year at all? Hurkacz. Hurkacz. Oh, dang. Yeah. I like UB. But that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's this, fine. this year, um, I, I don't think anyone in group in this group that we're watching right now and then in our group will go 0 and 3. I feel like there's at least one match that they can win. Um, it would probably be in the other group with Rublev and with uh, Djokovic, Medvedev, and Tsitsipas. You just mentioned Rublev. It's okay. I, I think that's the most likely person to go 0 and 3. Rublev? Yeah. Yeah. What I do would, you think? I would lean on that too. Yeah. But but statistically, does someone have to go 0 and 3 statistically in, in each, each of the group or no? No. No, no. you can go one and two, and you can actually go one and two and still qualify. Yeah, sometimes it's, mm -hmm. it's actually happened. It's rare, but usually if you win two out of the three, you're pretty safe. Yeah, unless if you lose the first and then you win the next two, then there's like a lot of set scenarios. So mm -hmm. like you have to win like. Yeah, oh, speaking of scenarios, really did you guys get um? Did you guys mention or uh, put congratulations in order for the Swiss Billie Jean King Cup team? Oh, yes, yes. Congratulations to Switzerland for defeating Australia in the Billie Jean King Cup. Uh, I'm going to try to congratulate Belinda Bencic and see if she unblocks me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. The discourse with Bencic on Twitter. Is <laughs> Some people like to call her the Wicked Witch, which is just I mean... amusing. Have you guys ever heard of, about why? Oh, have I ever said why I think I'm blocked? I, I'm pretty sure I know why I am, but it's so funny. Long story short, remember when she made the comment about Osaka 
doing things just to stay in the media oh, press. Yes. Oh yeah. yes, I do remember that comment. And she, at that point, she had lost like her last two WTA finals, and in, in, a, in conjunction with that comment about Osaka, she was pretty publicly in support of Zverev as soon as the uh, uh, allegations right. went live about his uh, yep. his, his domestic abuse. Um, and I, I think I made a comment like I, I didn't even mention her. I just said ben, Belinda Benches has made two very interesting comments and has lost her her past two WTA finals. And the next time I checked her page, I was blocked. <laughs> wow. I, I mean, heard, Ellen Perez, I know she does that a lot. You just mention her name and then she's up in your mentions in no time. Yeah. Um, I didn't think that was even a I don't think that was a low blow. I just it was just quantifying. Uh, yeah, things. ghosty. Yes, that did happen. Uh, this was <laughs> when I uh, Naomi Osaka withdrew from the uh, Roland Garros after playing the first round. That was when she refused to do press conferences just to preserve her mental health and was slapped with uh, at least potential hefty fines from ITF and all of the Grand Slams put together. Uh, and then she said, "Okay, I'm just withdrawing altogether because I'm not in the right mental state." And she did. And then that's when players were asked about it. And Benchic said that she tends to, uh, you know, do some things for attention, alluding to this, of course. And she, that, I, think her, I think her direct quote was, Osaka likes to do things to remain in the talk. And everybody right. was like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, that was, uh, if I can say, quite rich coming from Benchic because she yeah. has to mention Federer all the time. Right. right. Very interesting. Oh, yeah, Roger time. Federer texted me today uh, <laughs> on winning the Olympic gold medal. Um, Roger Federer texted me for reaching the. Oh, did she make the quarterfinal at the U.S. Open? Lost to Raducanu last year. Yep, yes. that was her. Yeah, yeah, right. So I mean, what I, I mean, I'm aware that there are people who are still very good friends with Zverev. You have Djokovic, yeah. Rublev. Uh, uh, team and even Tiafo was very pally with him last year. No Vienna. one no one's publicly like shunned him for the most part in the tennis world. Which is yeah except yeah except for the only one who's like I mean publicly shunning no one has done that. Opelka did that at Labor Cup. Uh, oh yeah year. the commentary yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes 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 yeah. only Opelka and Medvedev I know that uh you know immediately after the allegations went live he unfollowed Zverev and mm. obviously, I did not go and look this up. Like somebody posted the screen. We don't have that kind of time. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. But I mean, sometimes you do appreciate people who do have that kind of time to do some mm -hmm. stuff, right? He unfollowed, um, and he he was for. I mean, I think still is following uh, Zarev's ex, who was who claimed that uh, at least claimed. I mean, I think the uh, allegations uh, have you know, uh, you know credibility. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, let's just keep it as at she claimed. Uh, that you know she was abused by Alexander Zverev. Like he and even uh, Medvedev's wife are really good friends with her, and mm -hmm. that is when he decided, okay, I'm going to unfollow this guy. And it was really weird. It was that it was during the post-match presentation or trophy ceremony of the Masters, right? 2020. Yeah, yeah, 2020 was Zverev. Um, you know, like uh, was talking about. I think we're dig digressing here from the match. Yeah, I'm not keeping track of the score. <laughs> it's 15 yeah, so I was right talking now. about how he's his, uh, you know, behind his mask, he's smiling and everything, which obviously, uh, you know, rub people the wrong way. But yeah, and he also like singled out Medvedev's wife, like I've known you for a long time, which is really weird. He did that in Turin last year too. <laughs> really weird. Seems like seems like Big Germ wants us to focus on the match and on the match only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Point sorry, nobody. sorry, big germ. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> hmm. Last comment before we move on. Not to defend, but many of these do manipulate their own profits. You know, Jack. Fair take. Fair take. Oh yeah, Osaka definitely seems off, and I say that with um, the fact yeah. Uh, Osaka is a very interesting discussion point, actually, right now because mm -hmm. I'm not sure what her ambitions are in the sport anymore. Peter Bodo just did a write-up on her for the tennis channel or tennis.com about uh, is Osaka or is tennis losing Naomi Osaka? And I think a lot of the commentary or the, the quotes he got um, really backed Naomi Osaka, especially in terms of how she, how the Grand Slams dealt with her um, her not wanting to do press. I, I'm pretty sure Patrick McEnroe said he didn't agree with how like the other Grand Slams ganged up on her. But yeah. um, 
a, ever, ever since then, you can tell she's 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 probably been like at five hundred at best since that since that point, and the only bright spot being the um, the run to the Miami final. But I just watched her first round of the uh, AO twenty twenty one where she played Pavel Yuchinkova. There was there was real intent in every swing that she had, and she was swinging with so much conviction. I even tweeted about it and. This whole year, outside of maybe Miami, there's there's a lack of intent and conviction behind her shots, which is basically what her entire game is built around. So I'm interested to see what she does moving forward. Yeah, same. Especially because, uh, yeah, like that 2021 AO run and the 2020 US Open when she was playing with such purpose, you know, where you know, getting the seven masks and supporting, you know. Supporting the cause there against uh, po police brutality, you know, and like she was really playing behind in, in her purpose and she had this like conviction about her the way she played and uh, You know the power that she had off of both wings and just such a complete game in general For hard courts. I really thought she was just gonna take it and run and win many more and contest many more but something seems to have happened during that period and her motivation is also not quite there and you can clearly see that because she's scaled back on her schedule a lot. Like she really doesn't play enough. And at this point, you can't just go into these majors cold and expect to go all the way. And <laughs> not you know, when you're not not when twenty women can win them at any at any given moment. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you could no. like she, in the first round of the U.S. Open, she'd do Danielle Collins. Yeah, you know, which was like, not a bad match. Just a terrible. You can't work draw. your way. You yeah. can't work your way into a draw like that. Yeah, you, know, you can't do that. Yeah, and I actually thought it after the Australian Open lost to Nisimova, she looked. I, I predicted that she was going to have a much better year, and it just didn't pan out after Miami. Yeah, one all, one all early on in the second set. Last thing I'll say about Osaka to kind of wrap that up is her idol is Serena Williams, and we've seen Serena Williams' career look like you know mountaintops have really really high peaks and some really really low uh, troughs and moments. So hopefully this is just one of those low moments for her. She can work her way back to the top. She's still super, super young and has accomplished so much. So hopefully we see her back. If not next year, hopefully soon. Yeah. And she has she she really moves the needle. Like she has tremendous mm -hmm. amount of star power, like in terms of drawing people into the sport. Yep. Because Whether her you like background her or don't is interesting. Like her. her background yeah. is interesting. Her personality is very interesting. I loved her personality when she first came on the tour. The really funny press conferences and you know. The way Agreed. she was very self-deprecating about herself, but in a very humorous way, and I quite enjoyed that. It's combined with her tennis. Yeah, she just turned twenty-five, Jane. So yeah, yeah she's you know she's still she's young. Mad. Yeah, she has time to figure it mm -hmm. out. And I'm sure in whatever walk of life, like she, because she's so financially stable from all from everything she's made in endorsements and. Oh, speaking things. of financially stable, she just copped a big loss due to NFTs. Did yeah, anyone read that? I did read that. <laughs> yes. I still don't know what any of that stuff stands for. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I just know that it <laughs> seems like a fad, honestly. But I think one should probably know a bit more about that. Um, I'm, no, uh, I'm no expert. I'm not an expert either. I just know they're non-fungible tokens. You can, you know, yeah, uh, get you get them custom made, and you can have them. Yeah, and you see Wawrinka's the market. The monkey, and... That's all I know. Um, the way you said that was funny. I'm sorry. Right. Very particular comment, yes, but uh, you know. Uh, I know I was listening uh, to Tennis Channel's commentary before I hopped on here live with you guys, and uh Jim Courier said that the court was playing medium pace. Like I mean, some people just jump to the conclusion that because it's indoors, it's gonna be lightning quick, and there are very few if none at all, lightning quick courts on either of the ATP or WTA tours in 2022. But it looks like Nadal is being a little bit troubled with the pace of the court. Just a little bit. Just a little bit, yeah. I, I feel it like is, it's yeah. good that they slowed it down a tad from last year. I remember last year was much speedier. Yeah, I mean, we're having rallies this year, right? Last year, they were not very <laughs> Yeah, there was absolutely nothing. Um, three or four shots, and that's it. Um, yeah. Casper Root's forehand like, was really mm -hmm. shooting through the court today. Yeah. Um, and also, like, kind of that grenade effect um, it was having because it was the, the top spin. It was actually getting up pretty high on Felix's yeah. backhand, which I noticed. And Taylor Fritz was in an um, interesting position, 15 30. It was a backhand <laughs> when uh, 30 all, and now he's 40 30 all. Yeah. Game point. Let's, let's go back to the match yeah. now. Yes. Oh. 
also losing viewers, I guess, because of that, drawing viewers because of the gossip. Who knows? But uh, and, and sure some of them were the doll net the backhand slice, <laughs> and it's two one for the American who leads by a set as well. Um, right, I can. Uh, I can see this match slipping away pretty quickly from Nadal. It just takes one break Same. and that's it. Uh, obviously, Same. no player is broken serve yet. But at the same time, you yeah. generally don't tend to have any breakbacks of serve at all in these conditions. Um, For Nadal, it's I, just going to be about holding serve, keeping the set as close as he can. Um, and just yeah. like getting as Last many, getting as much as he can out of out of this match, like you know, just gonna be about like staying as long as he possibly yeah. can on the court. Yeah, just to get more and, and balls. I think that's year? gonna be his focus. Right. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, last year there was only one break back of serve. I remember it was Sinner was up a break in the decider against Medvedev, right? And he got broken back. Is there any yes. other? I don't think so. Berrettini, Zverev, 7 6 2 love. I think there was only one break of serve that match ended there. Sinner versus Hurka, just 6 2 6 2. Definitely no breaks of serve uh, for Hubi. Uh, then I'm not sure about Nori versus Rude. Maybe there was. I There was there was no none of that in the semis or the final. That's yeah, there might have Nori. been one in the, in the Rude versus Rublev knockout. For the semis. Oh yeah, there were there were there was there were two yeah in the second and the yeah. third sets where Ruble was up a break and he lost both sets. It's true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, other um, than that, and Ruble, Djokovic, and Rude Djokovic. Of course, what am I thinking? And Djokovic went on a break early in the first set, and then yeah, okay. he did end up like breaking back, but not many. Let's put it that way. And a break of serve, especially like say three, four, Nadal throws in a lose service game. I'm saying Nadal here because Fritz, aside from the previous game going to 15 30, is really not been troubled on serve so far in this match. Yeah. Nadal serves it one, two, obviously, as he bounces the ball, stares at the clock, ticking. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Right. <laughs> Oh, a good return good. by Fritz. Ooh, really good return from Fritz. And forehand online. Gets Nadal out of balance court. and goes yeah. for the forehand cross court winner. Nadal's taken off balance pretty easily, especially on the forehand side, right? Uh, Fritz doing well. Yeah. It's either the serve his doing that explosive or. Explosive you know. movement to his forehand, I thought it was a little better uh, in the early part of the first set. Something to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I would um, say because at this point in his career on these kind of courts, yeah. that is key. That has to hold up or he doesn't really have a chance. Yeah, so done best. up the tee and missed return on the forehand for Fritz, so 15 all. The good news mm. for Rafa is that his serve is looking better. Uh, that's the one. I was just about to say that, yes. uh, it I was, was, to Yeah, it looked quite scratchy against Paul, <laughs> I would say, I think. Wait, Nadal was down a break in the first set, wasn't he, against Paul? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was, and then he won. Yeah. Okay, Five really in bad miss from Nadal. Again, Fritz attacking yeah. the four in Nadal's forehand really well with some explosive ground strokes. Uh, that forehand missing by a lot. It was pretty much a forced error. 15 30, 1 2. This could get complicated. Small of course, for Fritz. Yeah. I mean, we've not had a break of serve so far. And again, Nadal stares at the clock as he's bouncing the ball. Um, but. It's pretty funny yeah, to see. Wide. But... Uh, Fritz stays in his back end corner. Another cross court rally. Fritz dragged wide. Nadal responds. Oh, another cross okay. court. Fritz is defending and... off his back. Wow. Back end cross court winner from Nadal in a huge fist bump. 30 all. Forehand, you mean? Forehand. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> like, it's okay. It happens. Yeah, it didn't. Yeah, I guess it lags a bit. To realize it's a lefty, right? You just see a ground stroke from that wing. You think it's a backhand, um, forehand. Yeah. Yeah. He's pumped. He doesn't want to. Nadal doesn't want to go down by the fight. Yes. I mean, typically, he doesn't want to do I that. I didn't but... see this at all against Tiafoe. I should say, even when he did take the second set, there was no reaction. Yep. Agreed. I feel like he knew that there was a very minimal. Um, I guess. Yeah. Ooh, bad there was, from Fritz down the line. There was minimal hand. stuff in the tank for him, sure. So he, I feel like he didn't want to do the extra that would kind of take more out of his tank than he needed to at the time. Yeah, he said in the last three games of the match, he felt like puking. That was in the third set. Yikes. So, uh, serves. might have just been like a minor stomach thing. 
40 30 and he was down 15 30 of course much like fritz was in the previous service game and let's see what happens here nadal's about to serve and he misses the serve out wide so he prepares for the second serve obviously does his wedgie uh, wipes off his ground. <laughs> you know you know the rest um sometimes he takes a while with all yeah. of this but whatever works i guess oh. second serve right fritz that gets a it big back second serve. yeah really good forehand that goes deep and nadal's backhand goes really long mm. and it's deuce. deuce tight yep yeah. fritz really has the firepower from the back of the court he does to hang with Nadal for sure. He does. Yeah. He has the firepower and depth. He's getting like really good depth on his shots. Yes. He he's still a little unassuming out there to me, though. Like a little, like I'm, I'm, I know he's a, he's shown at very good moments that he's a darn good competitor. But sometimes I like to see like what a player what a player's mannerisms looks like in between points. And Taylor Fritz can look a little aloof out there. <laughs> Just a little. Maybe it's yeah. a Southern California thing in him, maybe. I don't know. Good white serve, but Fritz gets it back deep. We're in a rally again. And uh, Nadal misses the forehand. Oh, cross. misses the forehand. Break point. Tried to get, tried to get more shape on it, but just uh, rolls it into the middle of the net. Yep, that is true. And yeah, Fritz can really take full control of this match if he wins this point. Yeah, he very much could. Let's see where Nadal goes on his first serve. Nadal yeah. looks stressed after every point he lo he loses. He looks like it. Yeah. He goes down the tee, but Fritz makes the return, and Nadal misses the forehand long. Misses. Interesting. Whoa, interesting. Fritz is up a break and gets yeah, converts that was, the first uh, of four break points that he's had this match. Fritz leads some... by a set in a break. I cannot say I'm surprised. Honestly, um, I did mention many times, uh, you know, in all of the. Shows that we did, the spaces, you know, John hosted uh, on Twitter and ones I did too. Uh, and on our uh, latest episode for the Popcorn Tennis Podcast, where, you know, where we had Gil Gross as a guest, it was me and Jethro with him. I did mention that Fritz should not be slept on because he matches up pretty well against a lot of these players. Never played Rude before. Nadal, we know he's beaten him. Uh, and Yeah, and the Fritz and Felix match is really 50-50. It's really it going to be about who gets the first strike. It's really yeah, tight. and oh. especially how we have seen Felix right now. Yeah, and it's interesting because Felix has not played top ten players consecutively at two shut a such a short span. Yeah. Uh, so and, see, and he's not he's, really a player who like immediately bounces back from like one bad loss. So he has a few of them before he gets back up. Right, if, if this year is anything to go by. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also wonder if that week off, that week off after Paris, I mean, it's probably a good thing for him rest-wise. Yep. But just having lost the semifinal against Rune after the 16-match winning streak and then, like, not having any competitive tennis last week. Oh, what a return that, uh, from Nadal. Oh, my goodness, yeah. <laughs> we really needed that. <laughs> Forehand inside out of a serve that was 220 kilometers per hour. Holy crap. I'm interested to see what these two losses do for the momentum of Felix, uh, yeah. whether he can bounce back really quickly in this tournament. Yeah, and we would have uh, a Tony Nadal derby, if you like, where both oh, yeah. players have lost um, their last two matches. Tony if... Nadal always makes an appearance whenever Felix and Rafa are in the same. Wait, the I, the didn't, I thought he purposely wasn't at... Well, no, wasn't he in the uh, coaching box for Nadal during that matchup at the French? He was. He was like sitting in the front row of the. Uh, uh, even though he was, he's currently coaching Felix. He was in the Dallas. Yeah. Bar. I mean, and I remember, and I remember the day before he won. was like, you know, I'm rooting for Nadal to win. I really won. You know, he has a really tough match against Felix next, and and all of that. I think they had an agreement, Felix and Tony, before they started working together. That if I'm playing Rafa, you know, you expect that. But nonetheless, it is. Uh, I thought it was a little bit unprofessional of him to give those quotes right before. Thanks for um, saying that. Facing 
<laughs> yeah. I do not like doing it at all. Um, I think that is very easy for me to say, but it's not the same as saying uh, I don't like, say, another marquee player. Uh, this guy is just a coach, uh, quite abusive from what you've read uh, from, uh, you know, Rafael Nadal's own autobiography, the way he sort of shaped up Nadal. Um, he was abusive from Nadal? He was, yes. He would actually... I think at times he was like really strict and he was very... Uh, I do give yeah, some... He would like actually, uh, uh, you know, aim balls at Nadal with the racket if he was like, if you were to look away for like a second or two. He wanted his full attention and all of that. And he would, and Nadal would mention that he would, uh, uh, you, you know, put him on a lot of mental duress, but he would also intimidate him saying that uh, if he would like go to his mom and say that, okay, you know, Uncle Tony was really hard on me. He would also say, oh yeah, you, and then the next day he, or a few days later, he would say, yeah, why don't you go uh, tell your mom about this too? I want to see if you have the courage to go and tell her. Like something along those lines. That is not good, especially hearing that in 2022. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't age well generally. But I do give the little a little bit of leeway to like the Uncle Tony, especially if he had the um, the agreement with Felix before the matchup was even on the cards. You can't just throw away um, family in lieu of professionalism. So I do give a little bit of. I give a little bit of understanding, I guess I should say, as to why Uncle Uncle Tony would have sided with Nadal, but him being front and center in the yeah, in the yeah, is a little extreme. That's a little extreme, but I do understand him. Just if it's like fifty one forty nine, I can understand the fifty one going towards uh, Nadal because that's your family and you've known him way longer, you know. So yeah, Nadal absolutely needs to hold. Absolutely. Just to give something to, for Taylor first to think yeah. about. Sometimes I really like covering uh, matches involving the best players uh, because that keeps me away from Twitter during that time and keeps <laughs> me away from really, really dumb tweets. I just opened, uh, you know, a message or like I opened Twitter to see a really ridiculous tweet about how, oh, I'm pretty sure Nadal is going to say that he was injured because he's losing this match. But that's exactly what I was mentioning earlier. Like it. it it sets even though I don't I don't mind the transparency of just hey I I had this issue going into the match or this issue flared up in the middle of the match I don't mind players talking about that but I don't think it's fair for like the general public to say that oh that's the reason why he lost or always go towards well Nadal is going to blame his body the man's turning thirty seven next year and has been on tour or been relevant on tour easily since two thousand and five excuse me so. Yeah. 30 I mean, all, 1 4. This is interesting. There's the good for me because I actually predicted Fritz to qualify from this group. Um, so let's see. He's got one match under his belt. You would expect him to win at least another. Um, plays rude next. Who knows? He could be the first to qualify. I mean, let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> Wait, did you, Fritz, you said Fritz has one match under his belt? Uh, no. If he were to close this out, oh, okay, <laughs> he's really close though. Yeah, man, no one, man, the ball comes back and wins. He's like, I, yeah, I, I, but I who person. knows, right? If it's <laughs> this is six, seven, one, four, thirty, I'll be very much in a few hours. Double fall from the dollar and it's break point for fit. This is a scoreboard, you know. If we do end up seeing in a few hours, like oh, another one of those Nadal comebacks. Yeah, Vance, screenshot, screenshot this, uh, Vance, please. I'm not I, the one I, to I do that. Miss. I think Nadal fans have a job, uh, or maybe uh, Vance. I'm thinking back do, to like, those like matches he played that. earlier this year, right against Korda. And yep, um, there's that one match we know. Please don't mention it. Um, yeah, I purposely didn't mention it just because. Thank you. You are you are a good friend. Is uh, it a Djokovic <laughs> loss? No, no, it's the Medvedev. No, no, no. Oh. oh, Nadal saves the break point with a backhand volley that was pretty awkward as well. Uh, so it's juice. The Djokovic one, obviously, I was really infuriated that he would not even take it to five sets from that position and that tiebreaker. But yeah. it's Fritz sort of grinning in a way because he did know that he was lucky to stay in that point. For as long as he did, right? Nadal serve and again, really good return from Fritz and forehand winner inside in. 
almost inside in, maybe more like up the line, I would say. And it's another break point for Taylor Fritz to serve for the match at 5-1. Yeah, very interesting. Um, really interesting because... The Dolph's movement doesn't look as good as it did in the first set. Something no, it is... doesn't He's a step slower, yeah. Yeah. He, he, either he's a step slower or uh, Fritz is really opening up his shoulders. And Probably just going... a bit of both. Yeah. Oh, really good serve from Nadal. Yes. Down the tee from uh, what would be his ad side. And yeah, there's juice again. Yes. But I, see, I, I must say, I see no serve. signs of injury though for Nadal. Like, I no, don't either. No. I think I there was only that Everything one. Indicates. Again, this, this, it's just the conditions. It's just the kind of uh, yeah. Uh, so where where his confidence is at right now, you know, he just needs he needs more matches like this against top players. And all approaches the net and whoa and wasn't clinical enough on the volley and uh, yeah. Fritz passes him, and that's a really nice backhand. Yeah. I should say that Nadal like to save these break points. Mostly, he's done well. The scoreboard wouldn't show that because just a break of serve would make that much of a difference. Yep. But here, Fritz has the third break point in this game. Nadal serve, saved two of them with really good serves. One with an unreturned serve and the other setting up a backhand volley that he put away. Where does he go on the third break point? Does he get the first serve? He does. And yeah. Fritz misses the backhand cross court. And it's deuce. Another good break point save from Nadal. Of course, they cut to his dad and sister. Not <laughs> a happy bunch of people, safe to say. Um, right, so third juice of this game. Fritz, again, um, if Nadal is to hold here, he cannot afford a letdown in the next game. <laughs> Taylor is a shirt biter. <laughs> he is. Is no, that is yeah? That one down the line is in from Nadal, and it's game point. His first, this game. Yeah, yeah. Taylor Fritz Rublev bites pretty much anything. His racket, his shirt, yeah. sweatpants, anything. It's <laughs> uh, right. Uh, and as Rev has a thing for chains, he bites all of his fifty thousand chains. Uh, with his 50,000 teeth as well. Okay. Um, oh, he misses the backhand volley. He misses the backhand volley. And it's deuce. Uh, Not a good miss. The crucial dogs. game already. Crucial game. Yeah. Oh, this is the reaction from Nadal. Literally. Mm, very interesting comment here. <laughs> Jane. <laughs> Jane asked a question earlier I wanted us to go back to about uh, Russians. Oh, well, where was that? Today. I think. Right. What do you guys? Hmm. All right. Second I hope serve not. Deuce. Right. Right. The doll using the backhand slice. Fritz going backhand down the line. And the doll misses the cross court backhand. Another easy miss. Fourth break point of this game for Fritz. And of course, Nadal has faced, I think, eight. So Some routine mistakes great. on the backhand today for Nadal, where, you know, it's not been necessarily the pace of Fritz that's caused these mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's just been him struggling to find that timing. Yep. And you, you can see, like, he's gesturing the motion and he's not quite having a good day on that wing. Good point um, from Jane here. And he misses another first serve. Yeah, Wimbledon yeah, no points. Second yeah, serve. Break I'd, point be, I'd, be, I'd be very surprised if Wimbledon keeps their, uh, keeps their stance in 2023. Very surprised. Was that... Oh, Taylor! It seems like Taylor Fritz has missed that forehand. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna up. challenge it, but it looked wide. Yeah, um, it looked wide, but let's see. And they would probably have to replay it if it's in, right? Because Nadal made the next shot. And it doesn't always work that way. Wide, so it's the, juice. That is on who's in the chair. <laughs> four oh, yeah, four right. break points in this game, and that was the third. With an underturn serve. 
Hmm. All right. First now skills. serving fifth juice. Misses the first serve. Uh, tees up for the second. Fritz is really hugging that baseline on the second serve, trying to take it early yep. and see what he does. Oh, oh that's a really, really good nice second serve from Nadal. But Fritz yeah. is still in the point. Slice that he got on that, my goodness. Oh, yeah, man. and Fritz misses the backhand, goes long. Yeah. That was like all credit to that second serve. That was, a... it was amazing. Yeah, he changed yeah. it up really well. Perfect execution, and that is Nadal's second game point after having saved four break points this game. Yeah, if we get started with this game, uh, watch out because. Yeah. Yep. I mean, this could very much be a turning point, right? If Nadal Absolutely. holds. We know he's going to get the crowd all pumped up. He's going to pump himself up as well. Yeah, uh, we do have that screenshot, by the way, of it. the breakpoint. <laughs> uh, yeah, Vanch has that, right? Or, I mean, obviously, you could always scrub back to it because. Oh, I yeah, actually, maybe I don't, that. but that's okay. You can always just. Yeah, you can just yeah, you could. Um, I don't think Tennis Channel has that, right? No, it doesn't. Has what? Oh, like you can like the option to scrub it. back to a given point. In oh, a... yeah, yeah, they don't. I wish they yeah. did, though. I use a streaming service kind of like YouTube TV, and I can scrub back if I wanted to. Oh, okay. That's nice. That's nice. And mm -hmm. Fritz puts away I the I hate how they got rid of... This is such a tangent, but I hate how they got rid of the option to not... And we're back to deuce. This TV. Is, I think... I want to say the sixth deuce of this game. Yeah, deuce number six. And yeah, again, really key if Fritz is to get the break here. I don't think Fritz has won a single point at net. I mean, has he even come to the net? More than besides that swinging volley, I don't think so. I haven't seen him up there. Yeah, he's he's not really um comfortable up there. That's one. No, not really. Yeah. Uh, how many net points? Yeah, he's I, oh I, actually five for eight, but most of those he's, haven't been like. He's been finishes. up there eight times. Could have fooled me. Yeah. Oh, I guess they're counting like you know the approaches. The, if Nadal misses a pass, I guess that counts as a net point one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Slice Nadal from using... Nadal, back and cross court from Fritz. Nadal oh, misses and... the forehand. Yeah, he's not Shots getting the... That is his bread and butter. And... Ah, he's not getting... He, he was falling back as he hit that shot, and he's not yeah. really able to hit it. And that is Taylor Fritz's fifth break point this game. Yeah. Ninth of this match, and he's one and seven up to this point. Of course, the scores are going to say one for eight um so yeah it must be said it took so much out of nadal yeah to have won the first two majors of this year i mean i can understand the letdown um combined with different circumstances i mean because who saw the australian open coming i didn't see yeah that. i mean what was that I, I, uh, Vance made a point about taking it taking so much out of Nadal's just tank and reserves to win the first two majors of the year and go yeah, on yeah. that win streak. I just I didn't see any of that coming. The French Open, yeah, but the win streak up until Indian Wells did not see that coming at all. Nadal double faults. Oh wow, yes, he does. Yeah, and Taylor game. Fritz is serving for the match five yeah. one with two breaks of serve in the second set. Yeah. And he's been up in both of these surface games. This set that he's gotten broken. At two one, I want to say he had a game point, right? Yeah. What are the odds that Nadal goes zero and three? Uh, I think pretty high. And by high, I mean it's not going to happen because uh, I guess that's how you say it, right? If the odds are high, that means there's less chance of it happening. No. No, no, think... no, no. It's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Oh, yeah. okay, no, odds are pretty low, right? Never mind. Yeah. Because you use the word odds. Never mind. Okay. I, I oh, okay. Were you going to get confused with like betting or something? Or... Okay. <laughs> I'm not a betting person at all, but I just think based off how he's playing right now, and if his next opponent is rude, it'll be or... Felix. Yeah. The losers play each other. Yeah. I mean, I think Felix can beat him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if, Felix this, would be the one to blow this is the level he This is the level he shows up with against Felix, and Felix kind of, you know, yeah. doesn't uh, take in the moment too much and just plays point by point. I can see Felix playing well enough to beat Rafa at this level, oh, yeah. on this court, on this particular court surface. See, what would have been more encouraging is it had he gotten better as the match went on, but yep. he just got Agreed. worse as the second set. Me too, Ghosty. Me too. Um, so it's oh, it's not like 2019 where pretty much every set that he played, he got better mm -hmm. at the ATP finals. 
And I think he knew he had to come out. For Taylor Fritz. You could tell he knew, he knew he had to come out all all guns blazing, because I don't yeah. I don't think he is. I mean, the, the kind of player that we know he is. He loves his reps and playing two matches after the U.S. Open in September isn't really giving him that. So I feel like he's still kind of, you know, he isn't really comfortable out there as he as he normally is. You can tell just by his mannerisms after he watches, after he misses, after he misses a shot. It's like I normally wouldn't miss that by that margin. So that's the other thing about the Australian Open run that is still so amazing to me is like the lack of preparation he had going in. Right. He did it's win like, that uh, Melbourne warm up, though, right? I, I know he did. It was like three matches, but like, <laughs> I don't know. Those are like three matches against, like, you know, opponents. Right, right, right. uh, I remember one was Barankis, the other one yeah. was Ruzuwari. Ruzuwari and, and Cressy, I think. And Cressy, yeah. I mean, you know. But still, not... like, no tennis for six months. Mm -hmm. He was on crutches and, like, I he guess had COVID in, in the December. Grand Slam, he sort of played himself into form. Okay, I mean, two match points for Fritz. And yeah. he misses the first serve out wide, and he has a second serve. Okay, he's managed his nerves well so far. Yeah. Um, he's kept his head down serve. for the most part. Uh, right, and let's see what happens. Nadal is... No, he misses and he one. misses. He Taylor Fritz wins. Yeah, fairly straightforward, I would say. Uh, yeah, it was, it was I don't really think close. I don't think that second set tells the entire story because it makes it seem like Nadal just got washed, but he definitely handed some uh, free points to Fritz for sure. Yep. Yeah. But a, 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 was, a competitive first yeah, set. I mean, yeah. Huge roar from Taylor Fritz. Um, if there's one thing people are probably may not uh, may not be aware of is that Fritz just makes these brings these comebacks out of nowhere turns. Uh, nightmare prospects into uh, butterflies. Really, I remember last year uh, it was it, RG where he was uh, taken off his match against Steve Johnson on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. He injured his knee. He underwent surgery back at Wimbledon. I think that was against Kupfer, but yeah, yeah, I know which match you're talking. Twenty-one about. days later, Torman is right. back at Wimbledon. Crazy. Yeah, and he pushes Rev to four sets in his third round match. Should have and been this year too, he does. He's not sure if he can even take to the court against Nadal in the Indian Wells final. He Ooh. goes there, wins, and wins the biggest title of his career. Uh, yeah. He was. He also got COVID. I want to say at Seoul. Uh, yes, and, and he was in lockdown for like a week. And yeah, and then, no he, and then, he up, then he rocks up in Japan and wins that tournament. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. He beat Shapovalov from behind in that semis, and he wins. Uh, in Tokyo, I think he yeah, beat and he Tiafo, beats right in the final. Tiafo in two tie breaks, and Tiafo was on a thirteen match tie break winning streak. Yeah, and he snaps that by yeah. beating him in two tie breaks. So he he has a really good amount of resilience and determination. And he does, yeah, it's good to see. Good to see that coming from a guy with an American flag next to his name. Yeah. And to me, honestly, he's felt like a bona fide top ten player this year. He, this is now his fifth top ten win. Yeah, he's now he, he won a title at pretty much every level this year, besides from a major. Yeah, and he's won two fifties before, right? Yeah, he's won two on grass. So he won Eastbourne again. Oh, wow. He's, he's, won, he's, won, he's won Indian Wells, Eastbourne, and Tokyo all this yeah. year. Yeah, this yeah. is by far his best season on tour. I mean, I wouldn't, yeah. I, if he wins this tournament, are there any predictions as to where his ranking would end up at the end of the year? Um. Well, right now he's number nine, right? So I'd have to see what the live ranking thing on that in the most, is. But if you go 5 and 0, oh, what's the most ranking points you can get if you go 5 and 0? Oh? 1,500. So, I mean, if he wins the whole thing without dropping it, it, it would depend on how, like, the other four players ahead of him do. But, like, mm -hmm. if they don't do as well, he could potentially be, like, four in the world. Or yeah, five. I was thinking top Just, five. Yeah, I was thinking top five, yeah. That yeah. would be great. I mean, has an American finished top five in the past Not 20 since years? Not <laughs> <laughs> Like, the past 20 years, I can't think of any. At least 10, for sure. At least 10 years. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see how much better he can get from this, because this feels like peak Taylor Fritz. Let, let's see if we can get even better, but this is... Yeah. I'm interested if Nadal finishes this tournament. The way, just I, something, I am as well. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see his press conference, actually, after this match. I, just the know, way he waves the crowd just now, maybe it's because I'm um, not too far removed from seeing Serena yeah. Williams wave at crowds a certain particular way. Um, right. He, I, I wouldn't be totally shocked if he... Um, if one of the alternates comes in for Rafa, I wouldn't be totally mm. shocked. Yeah, that would that be happened, all the room. That happened last year. That's how Yannick Sinner got his debut, right? There were two of them, yes. Sitsipas yeah. and Berrettini. Uh, Cameron Nori came in for Sitsipas. And um, 
Yannick uh, Sinner came in for Berrettini. Gotcha. Yeah. Obviously, oh, Norrie went 0 2. Sinner almost went 2 0, right? Um, Berrettini's one of my favorite players to watch for a couple of different reasons, but I feel like he has an unlucky injury bug that just follows him. Nothing like nothing that like derails his season for 12 months, but definitely takes like three to four, maybe five weeks to heal. And then he does the yeah, I mean, does this well. year was really unfortunate, right? It yeah. was um, like whole clay season gone because of the hand injury. Yep. Wimbledon, he wins Stuttgart in Queens. In and dominant ready, fashion, yeah. Yeah, probably number three favorite going into the tournament, right? Uh, one of the top favorites for sure. And he gets COVID. And it's mm-hmm. unfortunate. And yeah, the uh, US Open, I mean, he didn't even show up. I mean, he was he was there physically for that quarterfinal against Casper Ruud, but Casper Ruud dominated everything. I mean, up until the end, you know, so. Really, yeah. <laughs> Ghosty. Yeah. Oh, I, think, I think he said Miles has a thing for toothpick calves. I just think... <laughs> I just think Berrettini's, <laughs> I think Berrettini's calves just look small in comparison to his peers. I don't think they would look tiny if I was like walking next to him. Actually, yeah, I take, it's disproportionate, right? It's like, yeah, I think I actually saw him. I didn't get a picture with him or anything like that, but I want to say it was the night session on um, one of the like one of the Saturday or Sunday. I went to the U.S. Open this year, and he was just like he was surrounded by security, and I walked past him. And he's like my height, and I'm six four, six five ish. So he's you know he's he's pretty substantial looking guy. Yeah, all I have to say in response to Berrettini's calves is, I feel you, Mateo. Like day at the gym can be quite tough. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Very sure interesting. The to cats happen. to come up, right? To put it up here. I don't know if they showed it already before Fritz's interview. Um, so we're now going to get Fritz against Rude. That'll be the first time yeah. they've ever played first each other. First time they played, yeah. Interesting. Um, who do you think? I, I think the winner, well, I guess that depends on the score, too. The winner is likely to, to go on to the semifinals, right? Yeah, yeah. I would say Fritz is in the first place right now because he's lost with the fewest number of games. I remember right in 2012, Djokovic beat Songa in similar score line, 7 6 6 3 or something. Um, Andy Murray beat Thomas Burdich, and then Djokovic beat Murray 4 6 6 3 7 5. But there was still a sort of scenario where he could have gone out. Obviously, he yeah. once he took a set off Burdich, he was pretty much in. So, you know what, yeah. this match this match is reminding me of. I want to say 2009, Rafa went 0 and 3 in the round robin, and he yeah. had a similar type of year where he won the first two majors. Mm-hmm. Didn't play Wimbledon. Played the U.S. The Open. Major, yeah. Played the U.S. Open. Had an abdominal thing. Lost <laughs> in the semis. Oh my gosh, yeah. it's very similar. And yeah. then, and then he lost in Paris. He lost mm-hmm. in the semis to Djokovic. Yeah, and it was 2 and 3. And, and then he yeah, went 0 and 3 in round robin, and he lost with this score line to I want to say Davidenko. Similar type yeah. of player, you know, someone who can take the ball really early off both wings and rush them down on a quick court. Yeah, remember that. I remember, yeah, Djokovic yeah. is 2009, very similar to Nadal's 2019 as far as yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the scenarios. But this went. one, yeah, this one. I mean, he could go in three now. I'm curious to see whether he even plays in the next. I, match. yeah, maybe, maybe if he loses to Root, it would be in three. Uh, I don't know. It's just, I mean, I don't want to say he's going to lose to Root. I have I mean, played. he's never lost three matches in a row, has he? Like in a long, long, long time. Maybe last time. It was 2009. It was 2009, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So he's not, yeah, he's not lost more than three times in a row since 2009. That is insane, actually. Yep. Yeah, I guess in 2009, he went 0 and 4 to finish the year. He did, yeah. Because the Bear, Bear C lost. Because he lost to Djokovic, Davidenko, um, Soderling, yeah. and then Djokovic again. Oh, Soderling, I want to say Soderling, then Davidenko. Because yeah. Davidenko lost to Djokovic in the first match. Oh, then, man. I miss, I mean, I didn't like that Soderling upset Nadal, but I miss his forehand swing. I really do. Very unfortunate like that was one his of career players. ended the way it did because he yeah. was oh my god like his career yeah. was shaping up to be something really. Mm-hmm. I, I think he could have won a major um, at some two point. French Open finals back to back, right? 
Yeah. Yes, 9 and 10. In 09, Nadal loses to Federer. 10, he beats Federer, loses to Nadal. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. 11, Do loses guys... to Nadal in the quarterfinal. Do you guys... Uh, Do you... I remember 2010 was like a really... I mean, 2011 Australian Open was really absurd because you're seeded fourth. Remember he lost to Dolgo Polo in the fourth round in five sets and that match was two hours and 20 minutes for five sets. Yeah. Nadal lost to Dolgo Polo? No, uh, Soderling. Soderling, I think. Oh, gotcha. I was like, but Soderling had mono, and he was very unlucky because the first six months of 2011, he was playing great tennis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he won like four titles. He was winning playing that match against Djokovic, right? Uh, the quarterfinal in Rome. The first set was so gripping, and then from there, Djokovic like he yeah. he just completely steamrolled. It was six three six love. The first set, however, I think yeah, Soderling went up an early break or had chances to go up an early break, and like he was playing some amazing tennis there. Uh, so yeah, I think and RG again lost in the quarterfinal. Wimbledon they lose to Hewitt in the first second round, was it? What year? Uh, 2011 Wimbledon. Soderling lost to Hewitt, I think. Yeah, he because 2010 he lost to Nadal yeah. in the quarterfinal. Yeah, I remember he lost early at Wimbledon. Was it against was it against Tomic actually? I, I you know this Let was like me, the early yeah, start of my tennis I I remember it was against Hewitt, probably in the second round or something. Okay, maybe. Uh, pull up the draw. Should we switch our should we switch our commentary to the uh, most exciting thing in the season, the All American Cup? Oh no, he beat Hewitt and lost to Tomic. You're right. Okay, he beat I was right. Hewitt yeah. from two sets down in the second round. Right. Okay. Yeah. When did Hewitt retire? Ghosty, he retired in 2016. 2015 or 2016? Yeah, yeah, 2016. Yeah, he lost to Ferrer. He retired after Roddick? Wow. Yeah, Roddick retired 2020. He retired, but he kept coming back for doubles. So I don't know what yeah. that's good. Hewitt oh, is like, he, Hewitt will never leave the sport. Like, he's always. He's, he's doing the Xavier Malise captain. Or you know how Xavier yeah. Malise comes back once a year for the Antwerp indoor tournament and plays doubles? <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah. There's some players like that. Yeah. John, do you want to join us for a bit? Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear John's take on the All American Cup that Tennis Channel was shoving down it's on. It's a first. bittersweet day for him. Manchester United <laughs> won. England won the World Cup in cricket. And then Nadal gets team rolled, I guess. So, like, yeah. I don't know what to make of that. Obviously, John having a, a you know, preference for Nadal in tennis. Federer, oh, yeah. points one. Yeah, I'm just looking at the stats for this match. A lot of this can be explained by this. Yeah, I mean, look at the. I think it's the winner stun forced errors ratio for me. Yeah. Like, really minus, good. From... Minus 12 to plus 7. I mean, that's a big differential, yeah. obviously. Definitely some free points off of the backhand, for sure. Yeah. Just some, just some gimmies. Yeah. <laughs> Nadal, I'm looking at the picture of Nadal on the screen. He looks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying this for like the, maybe the past four months, but it just feels like Nadal, and I think someone said this in the chat, Nadal is like one injury or like just one life event away from being like, I'm tired. I'm too tired to do this. He looks like that in the picture. <laughs> like he loves the sport, but he's, he's, he's constantly like just on the, on the swing of, do I really want to keep doing this? I've been doing this for quite a while, you know? Hey, Hi everyone, How, how's it going? I, I got the call. I got the call from Shuhui. I saw, I heard it, and uh, there he is. Yeah, bit yeah. Of, bit, bittersweet, as, as he says. Um, Man United getting a last minute winner, but I think, in terms of from the Rafa side today of the net, um, it kind of looked inevitable from the minute he lost the tie break. Um, and it was always Rafa that was under pressure on his serve, if we think about it. I mean, I think I saw a stat that that Shrihui put up on the screen that he was 0-3 at one point. Um, uh, Taylor Fritz, in terms of the breaks, of the, of the break opportunities that he'd had, it was always Taylor that looked if either of them were going to break serve in that first set, it was going to be Taylor. So when Taylor wins the, the tie break fairly comfortably, um, I guess it was all fairly much downhill. I thought it was interesting what Miles said about at the end of the match as well, whether what we'll hear from Rafa. I just, I don't know. I just think he's a bit subdued at the moment. Uh, yep. I, I don't necessarily think there's a fundamental issue like there has been, for example, in the summer with the, with the, either the rib after Indian Wells or the, the abs during Wimbledon. 
uh, and the fundamental issue, of course, at various points over the last couple of years of this foot. I, I, I don't see that personally. It's not like we're seeing a limp or we're seeing, I think the serve is better now than it was, for example, at the US Open. Um, so yeah. I'm not sure. I, 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 I can't put my finger on it. Unless I was super close to his team, I, I probably wouldn't know either, to be honest. I don't know what your think, thoughts are, score, Miles. I think the reason the serve looks better is because he's intentionally trying to get as many free points as he can because he knows there's something either that he either that he has publicly said already or that he hasn't said for some reason that is making him believe he can't go the distance like he could even six mm -hmm. months ago. Or, mm -hmm. or like we were talking about earlier with the 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 Australian Open and the French Open going back to back, maybe that really did take a lot out of him more than he's let on. So yeah. the, the, the first serve, uh, you know, really being an emphasis now makes sense because that's going to be a way to kind of get you free points and set up easier points for you. So I, it does look like there's something going on and then in that that somewhat ominous wave to the crowd, even though, I mean, you're playing, he's guaranteed to play three matches this week. Mm -hmm. And he kind of waved at them like, oh, I'll see you next year. You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the same crowd you're going to be playing in for the rest of the week. So it's just interesting. I, I just would not be surprised at, I'm not, I don't want to see this, but I just would not be surprised by um, some sort of major announcement. We'll see. Soon we'll see. We'll I mean, see. Yeah. I, I think there's a, there was a lack of dynamism or whatever the word is, dynamism, from him today. We saw a couple of nice little overheads on the back, you know, the, the backhand side, if you like. And there was, at that point, you thought, or oh, maybe. But he, he he took the first point in that particular game. It was at 6-5 in the first set. And then he went and lost the next four. And, of course, something that Rafa doesn't have as much as someone like Taylor does is he doesn't have that serve that's going to give him unreturnables, if you like, and get him out of jail so often, if you like, especially um, uh, outside of grass, perhaps. But, um, listen, I mean, if he wins the next two matches, we could be looking at a very different situation. But as we know, even winning two matches is no guarantee, particularly if you lose in straight sets like he did today. So, yeah, he's he's got to win the next two matches. Um, I expect him to take the court on on Tuesday. I guess it will be, but but who knows? You might have something. What what are your thoughts, Vanch? Yeah, just like you, I also expect him to take the court most likely. But we'll mm -hmm. we'll wait and see what he has to say. But I I just felt like um I I was very encouraged in the first set actually. You know when he was saving okay. those break points and when he was serving better. To me, I thought he was serving much better than he was at the U.S. Open. Yeah, uh, especially in the first set, his toss looked a lot better, a lot more. Um, like it seemed higher up, it seemed like he was getting more MPHs on his both his first and second serve. So that was something I was keeping a close eye on, and um, he was getting his way out of trouble. So I, I thought the tiebreak was going to be key, but it was that third game in the second set where I felt like things just really started to fall apart from him, and he was getting mm -hmm. he wasn't moving nearly as well as he was in the first set, trying to get to certain shots on the run or just mistiming routine backhand. Sometimes it wasn't even the pace of Taylor Fritz no. that was causing those errors, but it was just him not having a great feel on that shot for some reason. Um, and both on the forehand and backhand at times. And uh, just felt like something was missing. Oh. I mean, he was trying to get it back. He was trying to hold desperately for 4-2. And then, you know, so there were these moments, like pivot moments that you felt like, okay, maybe a comeback is on. Yeah. But it just, uh, it wasn't meant to be. And Fritz was just hitting with a lot of depth and just made it a lot harder for Nadal to really impose himself the way he would like. But the other um, thing, though, is and, and, and I think is uh, I think cool. one more thing, last thing is that uh, he didn't get better as the match went on. That's kind of no. a little bit worrying for me because he's had matches like this at the World Tour Finals, but he sort of worked his way. I remember in 2019, he just got better at, like almost every single set that he played, and it wasn't mm -hmm. enough to get through the group. Just don't but mention the like, second match. So. Yeah, but then <laughs> right, but then you just you, you know you you just you have to see these signs of him improvement and i didn't see that a whole lot in the second set so i'm not no and he's sure. fading he's fading yeah. in matches and, and mm -hmm. fading we're not talking about five sets deep in the fifth set or something like that or in a talking in about a, an hour and a half yeah <laughs> you know yeah. we're talking we're talking 45 minutes in an hour in and he's fading like he did in paris bercy as well pretty much from the middle of the second set uh yeah. fourth set to some extent i guess against um against uh, TFO at, at the US Open. And then then today, really, from the minute the third set began, he was sort of blowing, or second set, sorry, began, he seemed to be blowing. And 
Yes, there were some lengthy points where he did put seem to have to put in a few more steps, for example, than his opponent because his opponent was playing very well. And by the way, Fritz served unbelievably today. I thought um, I saw a good service uh, game or good service match from Kasper Ruud earlier today as well, especially for someone who's not super well known for his serve. Although I do think Kasper's made a lot of improvements, but but Taylor's serve was just you know un, un, untouchable. But on the other side, I still felt Rafa could have been a bit more aggressive on that. I, I felt as though, like I said, with with the lack of dynamism from from Rafa today, I think again on the serve he could have gone for it a bit more. A couple of times he did go for it, and a couple of times it worked for him. Of course, it's not going to work all the time, but if you go for it on the on the return, uh, maybe maybe stay pretty deep with Taylor's first serve, but but go aggressive on the second. You know, with with Rafa, he's got one of the top, you know, one of the best returns, Djokovic aside on on the tour. So, yeah. Anyway, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on it, Shrihui. Oh yeah, I have quite a bit. Um, uh, obviously, Van, you and Vanch have uh, made some really good points as well. Vanch mentioned that he was struggling quite a bit on his forehand side, which you don't see quite often. We know his backhand has declined now, but for him to like be so off balance on his forehand uh, as often as he was this match was quite alarming to see. Uh, yes, Fritz was really good with his returns. He was getting all of them deep. Uh, he was amazing from the back of the court. That being said someone of Nadal's caliber I think shouldn't just be dismantled by that and like you like you also mentioned uh it and bunch as well it didn't get better after the first set it just looked like it went downhill Fritz gets that break in the fourth game he holds barely tested on serve except for that I would say third game he was 15 30 down but yeah other than that Fritz I don't, he didn't even face a break point Nadal had that game at 1-4. Um, I don't really think that if he did hold serve, I mean, it would have just been a better scoreline. I don't think yeah. that would have been the turning point of anything. I'm easy to say now. But mm -hmm. uh, I, but if there's any, if there are any positives, he served well for most part. I think mm -hmm. uh, he's faced eight or nine breakpoints. I'm not sure. He, served, he saved most of them with really good serves and either good plus ones or almost all of them were... Uh, uh, all, almost all of the breakpoints that Fritz missed were unreturned serves. So the, those are a few glimmers that we see, but then that fighting spirit is just, I mean, sub completely subdued. Uh, the first set was very encouraging until that, obviously, the tiebreaker, of errors that you wouldn't expect Nadal to make also. Um, mm. So, yeah. And it was kind of precarious when he started it really off really with a double fault. Right. It just felt like... Starting it off with a double fault and then two. I mean, he's two going more on aggressive serve. on the second serve as well, which I do think I understand. But but that would may also suggest that there's a there's a um you know a, a, an anxiety about lengthy points and matches. Yep, yeah. probably. Uh, I would say that. Yeah, it was the tiebreaker? The quite a few misses, and then even the second set just. Yeah, really, really subdued. I mean, I was encouraged in the first set, but then I should say that I wasn't surprised because I knew that Fritz can beat him. I have him qualifying along with Felix for <laughs> along with Felix. We'll see how that ages because Felix has just lost his first match. But yeah. uh, this next match could be really important. I think for Felix, maybe uh, a good prospect because yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like Felix did have that uh, long winning streak. It was snapped by Holger Rune, but. At the same time, when he does lose a match, almost always he loses the one immediately after, right? Maybe a few losses for less wins, and then he's sort of back. We saw it in the clay season, he lost uh, early. I think he played Marrakesh or something, and he lost early there, lost early uh, even in the Masters until... Yeah, Madrid and Rome were okay, but then he played some tournaments where he did lose early. Uh, bad sunshine double also, I would say. Uh so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see because I think this is, for him, the best chance to sort of get back on track because Nadal is just... If you sort of get the get one hand on the match, which is which translates to winning the first set, it is quite... Or winning a set, really. It's... Uh, especially off late, it's quite uh, easy for you to see through the match. And that's Nadal's third loss in a row, all three to Americans also. Yep. So, uh, Larry, are you are you excited about this? Are you, are you like internally glowing about Nadal? Not Rudy? really. Um, like I wouldn't say that. Like sure, you know, like rooting against uh, your favorite rivals, part of sport. It's Absolutely. fun. It's fun, Fair, especially yeah. when 
uh, the rival is doing very well. It is fun mm-hmm. to do that. It's fun to like uh, root for the for the underdog. But at the same time, I don't want to take too much pleasure out of such losses. I don't at all, honestly. Like, I'm not going to like, I'm going to keep up that word also. I'm not just going to end this broadcast and go back to trolling the doll on Twitter. Um, right. So, yeah, I just, I just cannot take too much. I mean, I was happy to see Tiafo play the way he did at the US Open. But since then, and since I'm seeing some sort of pattern and vulnerability shown by Nadal, I'm not really happy. Like, uh, that doesn't mean like I, I if if uh, the way for him to get back to uh, 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 you know his winning ways would be to beat someone like Medvedev. I'm not gonna do that either, right? So uh, yeah, like yeah, I think I feel I feel what you're saying, but I also feel like for me because I've been um, enthralled in tennis right around the time the doll started his dominance, especially in 2005 and 2006. We've almost been, not even almost, we've definitely been treated to elongated career compared to what a lot of people thought with Nadal. So I just feel like it's a mixture of two things happening. We're seeing that elongated career that a lot of people didn't see happening kind of come come to or come closer to an end, I believe. And we're also seeing guys have a lot more confidence when they go up against them because of that impending realization that he's closer to 40 than he is to 30 at this point. So um, I don't, I, I feel like it's just a natural progression of sports. I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be hurt or disappointed if Nadal starts losing um, to these up and coming guys, just because I feel like, like I said, that's a natural progression. And I'd rather that happen than to see him go out on like some on court injury or just not do it on his terms. I'd, I'd, I'd rather see the new guys or the new, the newer guys that he's helped inspire or help level up in a way, come up to his level and just beat him fair and square, you know? So it's just the, natural cycle of sports i believe i think I, I i feel like that's what we're seeing happening yeah i do agree uh if i mean the, the decline's inevitable if you yeah. were to have it one way much rather have it with you know the younger guys sort of getting the better of him rather than uh harmony tan yeah yeah get, getting injury <laughs> letting injuries sort of dictate his schedule and you know forcing him to hang up his boots that would not be nice yeah, um, yeah. i still want to see a little bit more before i actually call it a decline like it's you know yeah. it's right. still yeah like, fast yeah it's a little early it's a little early, early but it, 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 this still doesn't yeah. mean that much to be honest he's still in a mm-hmm. position to still very high in the ranking he's still two in the world with a chance to be number one like i mean i'm not gonna like he's lost three matches in a row for the first time since 2009. So, like, yep. you know, it's mm-hmm. I, I, I wouldn't read like out, so much into it, this. He also well. went out in the US Open. It's the first time in five years that he's gone out that early at a major that he's yeah. contested. I, I agree, though, Vanch. It's, you know, it's let's say from Wimbledon until now, it, it's four or five months. It's probably 10 it matches. It can happen, you know, like and that. there's like, you know, there was a long break in between. His, yeah. He just I mean, this kid, is, like, if it it's, continues. It's understandable. If it continues for another four, five, six months, and we get to roll on Garros, yeah. If we, we get, get to roll on Garros, Garros and he's not won a title or something, maybe yeah. I'd be a little concerned. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, it's a much bigger test and a much more uphill task. To, like beat him in a best of five, that doesn't change yeah. really. Um, Australian exactly. Open, I still think uh, last year it was there was there was some gray area. I mean, I would say this year, not last year, uh, or let's say last year, right? He. His last match was against uh, Lloyd Harris in Washington. He didn't yeah. play from mm-hmm. RG to Washington. He, he beat uh, Jack Sock and he lost to Lloyd Harris. Mm-hmm. And that's when he called uh, quits on a season. Um, so I think players didn't... I mean, he sort of also like was able to free up his wings and uh, play a lot loose, I would say, at the Australian Open because he was not really the favorite. It was Medvedev and Zverev ahead of him, even when Novak was not playing at that point. Um so that was there, but then I think I I don't know how this will translate to the Australian Open, but players are going to watch these matches, see these results at least, and know that he is vulnerable. He's in a vulnerable spot. Yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe. Let's see I what don't he does between if, now and know, the Australian if Open. If Djokovic's though. participation, if he does participate, I don't know how how much that changes Nadal's, uh, uh, you, you know, the weight on Nadal's shoulders as the defending champion, but. Yeah. Yeah, that's just what I think. I realize he's going to play an exhibition with Casper Ruud on the 23rd. Yeah, in South America, which I also so thought seems a bit odd. This, I Nadal or Djokovic? Yeah. Nadal. 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 
Yeah. And then I, I don't know if he's playing in Abu Dhabi again, but no, he's I not. would imagine no. That Probably would be not. My yeah, the Abu Dhabi actually. field is I think the women's Radu Kanu and yes. another player. I'm not sure who. All but of this is yeah. in December, right? The dogs. Yeah, yeah. I usually don't watch tennis in December. That's like my month off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. having lived for many years in the UAE, I've watched that tournament. Especially as a kid, I've watched that tournament so many times. Um, in 2011, it was a stack line. I remember it was the big three, and then it was Songa, Ferrer, and Monfils. That was probably the best lineup ever in Abu Dhabi in 2011. But I think he played uh, Abu Dhabi uh, just. Re- I know he played in 2019. I'm sure he's played other years as well. But I do think that the Abu Dhabi yeah, um, tournament year. he played in 2021 was part of the comeback. Uh, if yes, you like, yeah, he did lose both matches, right, to Murray yeah, and Shapovalov. Murray and Shapovalov. But but uh, as it turned out, I mean, I was I thought, mm, okay, that's not. Although I think he played okay, but I, I didn't have any clue that that was going to be the uh, the beginning of of, of, of a return of, like he did <laughs> in Australia. But um, yeah. but I mean, I do think this this these uh, what do you call it exhibition matches in Latin America? I I don't know. I just think it's very odd, um, yeah. for considering he's been saying stuff about obviously he's had a kid recently. He's had these ab injuries as well. Blah blah blah. Um, you know, for someone who really going onto a different surface as well in a place so far away. I mean, if this was hardcore exhibition in Europe. Okay, maybe, but going to Latin America, it's um, it's, it's yeah. a head scratcher. It's definitely a head scratcher. It's a head scratcher. I agree, and I, and also you can do this. You could do this in a couple. Of, he could be retired and do this. You know, yep. I, 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 when Beckham went, I know I'm going off at a tangent here, but when Beckham went to California at like 29, I'm thinking, what are you doing, man? You could go there when you're 39, and, and people will still love you, uh, and, and you could do that. You you're still. I think Federer did that in 2019, right, with Zverev. There was that whole South American tour of exhibitions. Yeah, I think they did a did few, it? yeah. Well, I mean, and then, I mean, I don't know. And then, yeah. of course, within a few months, he's basically done, if you like, in terms of, right. I think the last time we saw Federer in, a, in any sort of super, super competitive shape was probably the ATP Tour Finals of 2019. You may even go back a bit further than that, but... I'll start you up in 2020, he looked pretty good. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think he was carrying an injury. The knee was bothering him in, in Australia. And he I looked know he good result-wise to get to the semi, but in, yeah. in, the, in route to that, yeah, it was, I mean, it was very Sam complicated. Was I mean, I mean, John Millman. No, it's Tennis Sandgren. Tennis Sandgren is pushing you. Yeah, because Tennis Sandgren can't, get even, can't even get out of quarterfinals of challenges yeah. at this point. So Right, right. You know, just imagine Federer didn't make it to the semis. He would have ended his career... You know, beating Djokovic, Nadal, and Murray in this, the last time he played them. Yeah, does I mean has nothing to do with him even making the semis, right? But he would he 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 obviously would have wanted to make the semis nonetheless, and he did put up a really good fight. Also, yeah, uh, yeah so, there's a comment here. Fed is a nice draw. Hmm. He did have Fuchovic in the fourth round, which is yeah, tricky did, for a yeah. set. It was right after Milman and a long yeah, match. Milman, is, Milman has always been tough for. Yeah, so even far. even Halle 2019 was not yeah. easy. I remember even the Federer one. It was like seven six six three something like that. Milman is a yeah. pain for Federer. He took a took a set against him. It was 2014. I want to say they played. Yeah, basketball. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Milman, so, yeah. I, I have to go by the way, but just before I do, I'm just looking at a bit a few highlights from earlier. The Casper is on my screen right now. Casper Rude Felix. It wasn't the most exciting of matches, in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe I'm being a bit down on it, but no, you're right. You're right. It wasn't the no, most right. exciting. Like zero very small margins. For the first um, 14, 15. Games we didn't even have a juice until I think the some point in the second set. Um, might be yeah. the beginning of the second set, uh, or at least that's my memory. It might have been towards the end of the first. Very set, little but. separating them actually. In the first set tiebreak, Felix missed like a backhand at five four, wide. It was like a shank, and then that was the, basically the set. 7-4 yeah. in the tie break, and then one really bad game by Felix at 3 all to get broken. Yeah. Um, essentially. I, I'm going to leave you guys, but listen, you can go on. For, I mean, maybe you maybe have to, all of you have to get off to your to your own lives, but feel free to carry on for a few more minutes or as long as you want. But I'm going to leave you guys, right? And then I'll, um and just right. when I mean, you're done, just yeah. click end. Yeah. I mean, I'll be back tomorrow anyway, uh, commentating for Medvedev versus Rublev. And you know, oh wow, that's really early. This. Five a.m. for me. Yeah, it's early for you. But I mean, have, maybe you have could. You guys, have you guys ever seen an exciting rude match? I feel like Ghosty's throwing a little rude shade there. Uh, hmm. I want to say, like, there, there are people that come to my mind. Oh, like, his match! His match! The match against, against Chilich was exciting at the French Open semis. Um, I, I quite enjoyed the last whatever three sets of that. His matches, his match at the um, 
his matches in Miami weren't bad watches. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the US it, Open. Uh, US yeah, Open the US match Open. against yeah. Tommy Paul. That was very exciting. It had drama. It was, you know, he was pushed to a fifth set. The Hatchinov match when he the, that set point where they played like a fifty-five shot rally. I mean, there's quite was, a bit yeah, actually. And Rude, Rude and Rune was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, Rude and Rune was. Yeah, great. this one. Uh, I want to say also his match against Berrettini in Rome, twenty twenty, was really good. Um, yeah. I remember what yeah, was it? Yeah, third set tiebreaker to Rude won, and he lost to Djokovic in the semifinal. His match against Rublev last year in Turin was good. Yeah, too. that was exciting. Hey Vance, I meant to ask you this too. I know you're you're pretty uh, strong on like Generation Farms, um, which is oh yeah, which is Felix Alcaraz, Rune Farms, Rune Musetti, and Sinner. I think Musetti, Musetti is the biggest biggest in that five group. But who's um, who's the yeah. S? Who's the S? Sinner. Sinner and F. Musetti is yeah. the weakest. Yeah. W yeah, yeah. Where would you put um, Draper and Nakashima? So I have them right now, just a tier below those guys. I have them, like tier two for me is like Baez, Draper, um, Nakashima. Like they're kind of in that tier. And then you also have players like the Hechka. Like he's also from that What about well. Korda? What does what Korda And Korda. Well? Korda's in that group as well. So Korda, Korda Nakashima, and Nakashima, they're all in that uh, tier two right now. Korda, like I, every time I see him see on court, it's like... He looks a little... Not, I don't want to call him lazy because I don't think he's. I mean, I don't think anybody. Not lazy, right? But he just looks a little. Ah, oh, man, I can't really put my finger on it. I but, like the way he goes about his tennis, right? Like it's, it's a nice little boring. Yeah. It's a I little think he boring. needs to like get a little stronger physically. I feel like he's yeah. He's, the he's, oh, it's, oh, it's like Vera in 2017 or something like that, or 2016. Yeah, yeah. Like just some more muscle would be nice, you know. You could <laughs> just a bit more yeah, durability, a bit more serve and like physical, and and like too many errors as well. Like when uh, uh, you know the he gets a little slap happy, happy sometimes. He can spray balls and just uh, <laughs> get yep. a little out of control that way. But hmm. but I actually think he has one of the best backhands. Like he's yeah, really, really his game is, his like game is super, super smooth. Super yeah, smooth. it's very it's like very like his ball striking ability is like Burdich esque. You know when he can like. Take time yeah. away. It's like very fluid. He actually reminds me of Sloan Stevens a bit, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Like Sloan is very smooth mover and very smooth, but like you can tell you can tell there's an extra gear somewhere looming, but they yeah. have they have an either I think you know in that way Monfils reminds me of Sloan Stevens because like you know they have all of the firepower, but then they mm -hmm. choose to prolong the rallies. And then it's just interesting with Corda. I don't know if Corda realizes how to tap into it yet, but whereas Monfils and Sloan, we've literally seen them tap into it. It's just a, a matter yeah. of choice or what they kind of go up for that makes them tap into it. So yeah. that's because they've been on tour longer. Yeah. Smooth yeah. as our baby butts. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so to run up today's results, Casper Rude beat Felix Ogier Aliasim in the first match of Green Group 7 6 6 4, followed by Taylor Fritz. Uh, I want to say upsetting, at least ranking wise, Rafael Nadal 7 6 6 1 in the second group, second match of the green group. So that means Taylor Fritz and Casper Ruud will play each other for the first time uh, on, on day three, I want to say, in the second day of this group's play. And Rafael Nadal, of course, will play Felix Auger Alias. Same that match could be a knockout uh, match, pretty much. Um, and I think John just put it up. Um... That the Felix Nadal match will yeah, be first. that would be the first match followed by Taylor Fritz and Casper Ruud. Yeah, the winners I guess get the preference, you know, to play a little uh, later. I guess I don't know if that's how it works, uh, but yeah. Tomorrow, of course, is uh, the group that is I would say uh, that has the most anticipation, the more explosive group of the two. Uh, start off the day we have Daniel Medvedev versus Andrei Rublev. Followed by the evening match, which will be Stefano Tsitsipas against Novak Djokovic. Of course, I will yeah. be here for both matches. I won't be commentating as much for Djokovic's match against Tsitsipas for all the right reasons. And I thought I would produce that uh, match, uh, you know, because I could do a better job with a Djokovic <laughs> match as far as that's concerned. And especially someone like Tsitsipas, who he's played so many times, I could. Uh, you know, pull up a lot of interesting trivia. So, you know, make sure you tune into that. Subscribe to this channel. Thanks for joining us, whoever joined us. And, you know, it was great having uh, John for as long as he was here with us. It was great having Miles 
uh, join us it was great of course uh, having bunch my really good friend on here as well uh, thanks guys for you know, you know joining us today and hope to see you soon of course take care guys yep. cheers yep see you